very special welcome, welcome to Maria Jose Arregui, who is the driving soul of Luzon Foundation, with which from the very beginning we have been working. I repeat, for a very noble and fair cause. I would like to thank the speakers and the whole team of the efficient Luzon Foundation. It seems it was yesterday, Maria Jose, when we started our collaboration, driven by the enthusiasm and endeavor of Paco Luzon, whose strength was contagious and starts to, keeps on inspiring us. The history of the relationship between the Luzon Foundation and the Ramona Luzon Foundation is a history of friendship, affection, solidarity, and love. We have collaborated all together from the very beginning, thanks to the initiative of Joaquin de la Ran, who is some way around. I don't know why aren't you here at the first row? And we keep on collaborating, and we will keep, we will do it as long as I'm here at least. We share with the Luthon Foundation the values in, of, the, in, of the faith in what we do. We persevere in the, our efforts and the conviction that sooner or later we will be able to win over that very cruel disease. The patronage of the Foundation Ramon Areces had decided to enhance even more so the actions that we do implement since a long time regarding rare diseases and unfrequent diseases that have always been a priority in our scientific council. We are going to potentiate that, enhance it, and we will keep on supporting research and treatment programs more necessary than ever. With research programs, where what we have to do is to do research as well, as we have always done. This task reminds me sometimes the statement of a medieval historian that said that this task and the fight in order to reach it could be comparable to the efforts of the workers in the Middle Age that built the Gothic cathedrals. They knew they could never be see, see the whole work, but they kept on working with a great effort. Let's see if in this case we are able to finish this work as soon as possible. Thank you very much, and I give the floor to Maria Jose Arregui. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before anything else, always our sincere gratitude to the Adithas Foundation in order to keep on supporting our initiatives that, as Raimundo said so rightly so, from the very first time, the Adithas Foundation has been with us. It has believed in us and it has been accompanying at every point in time. That's why we would like to sincerely thank you for in our seventh scientific international meeting of ALS. It's a tr great honor to receive in this event researchers, both national and international ones, because in life we all have a mission, and you do meet that function, that role. And we, as a foundation, we should uh, uh, abide by our, by our duty. In this setting, it's the commitment of spreading the knowledge and transfer to the society, especially to the community of ALS, the idea that we are working enormously and with enthusiasm from many different labs that are distributed throughout the world in order to be able to uh, achieve the, or find the right moment that modifies forever, first the scientific approach and then the medical approach of lateral amyotrophic sclerosis or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Those meetings are helpful to share the results of uh, the state of research and feed back the knowledge creating collaboration synergies between the whole scientific community. We are organizing this event now, and it's, it's seven, the seventh time we do so. 2023 is the year of the 30th anniversary of the discovery of the SOD1 gene as causing the family ALS. Although it is true that in 2018 that the, the topic of the RSS meeting was genetics, since then, the situation has changed very much. 
We are in another scenario with new dis genes described and with clinical trials that start using uh, gene therapies. Apart from that, at present, epigenetic and metagenomics are in the daily life of the scientific discussions. Hence, in this meeting, we will talk about genes and polymorphism, biomarkers and epigenetics, genetic advances in the diagnosis, treatment, and animal models before this new, from this new perspective, showing the challenges that we have to face at present. Thank you to the sponsors that make possible to have funds for basic research. I can't stop naming Juan Carlos Unzue and the Banking Foundation La Caixa are two great important persons in our goal in, of support to research. And no doubt to all of you who make possible that with your small contributions, we, are, we will be able to achieve something great among all of us. And as Raimundo said, soon we finish the work of this big cathedral. Now I will give the floor to Dr. Alberto Garcia Redondo, that will, but not before uh, mentioning who he is and what he does. And Dr. Garcia Redondo, for us and for the whole com ALS community, is a very well-known person. He is the main researcher of the research laboratory in LALS of the Health and Research Institute of the 12th of October Hospital Madrid. Apart from other merits, he is professor at the Complutense University in Madrid in the Faculty of Pharmacy in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So that, thanks to all of you who are present, those of you who will attend, be present in this meeting through the streaming, and I give the floor to Alberto and we start the meeting. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to having you here with us and also the people via streaming. I hope that you will ask many questions and that you don't forget about asking any. All questions are fantastic and we shouldn't forget, forget them and we will have to try to solve them here. I have to thank the Luthon Foundation as well for those fantastic meetings that it does every year together with the Ramon Adelzer Foundation that is always close to us in order to develop this meeting. And of course, for having chosen me as a moderator of this panel in which we're going to speak, as Maria Jose has said, about genetics, fundamentally genetics of how uh, they are, uh, the features that make up people are written our genetics, not only that make us people, but they generate our differences. And in the case of medicine, they are very interesting because in many occasions they give rise to the onset of or not, or not of a disease. We're going to, we are going to talk about biomarkers, biomarkers that are very important in the world of ALS, because if we had uh, adequate biomarkers we could diagnose before, we could treat before, and we could know as well how a patient is going to develop a different symptomatology than the symptomatology of any other, another patient and better develop clinical trials as well. And the epigenetics world as well that is, that is flourishing today as probably uh, one of the great hopes for the knowledge of the medicine and that try, uh, deals about not those letters of that code, that text that appears in the book, that is the genetics itself, the sequence of DNA and its letters, but also it goes beyond that. And epigenetics talks about, as Manuel Esteller said, about if we put a world in black letters, in bold letters, if we underline it, if we give it a greater source, a greater size, or if we decide that this word has a mild color so that it, we can't read it properly. How the sequence of the genes are expressed or not in a differential manner in different people or in different tissues of the same person. And this is going to give rise to different characteristics of a disease in the different patients. We'll start with Dr. Jan Veldink, who comes from Utrecht University in Holland. The general goal of his research is understand the environmental causes of 
ALS and related diseases and understand how a mutation can be seen giving rise to different symptoms and or diseases. He has participated in the development of several technological innovations as a panel of reference that is customized that allows to detect rare genetic variants and a tool to detect that it's very complicated, the expansion of the repeats of the gene, gene uh, 1972 and other expansions in data obtained by means of the sequencing of the whole genome. At present, he is chairing an collabor international collaboration at a large scale, probably many, most of you know, the Project Mine, Project Mine, and that you can look for information about it uh, in a very easy web page. And one can develop events that allow to enhance it and develop it, because it this project, what it tries to do is sequence a complete genome of 15,000 patients with a sporadic e ALS, not the patients who have a head genetic inheritance, but the other patients, the 90% of patients who we understand should have some genetic own characteristics, but that we don't yet know too well. And thanks to this project, they will be known. And 7,500 controls in the population at present. Uh, the project of Jan Welding, they have completed more than 10,000 genomes from 10,000 patients with sporadic ALS. Once this project is finished, they will, we will have standardized information on the data on the complete genome, data of polymorphic matrix on point variations in the DNA, and data of methylation for each sample epigenetics as well. And he has started successfully a database, and this is very important, of international collaboration that is shared that contains clinical data, basic data and detailed data of the patients, and special data on the environmental exposures and lifestyle factors of thousands of samples. With all of you, Jan, you have the floor. You can come to the podium. If you, if you have been listening, please don't speak too fast. Spanish is much longer than English. Thank you so much for coming. Muchas gracias por venir. <clears throat> okay, so that's the only Spanish I have. I think I understood everything, sort of. So, so I think I think you you had a, a crash course on genetics just now. Um, but first of all, before I start, okay, thank you. Gracias, gracias. Um, is I have to apologize for my fellow Dutchmen. So when I was in the flight over this morning, I, I uh, found myself among Feyenoord supporters, like our soccer team in, in Holland. And tonight, of course, is Atletico Madrid Feyenoord Champions League. And Feyenoord supporters have quite a reputation. They usually ruin a city or they're drunk. Or, so I, I apologize before they are drunk. Um, <laughs> Feyenoord is not my team. <clears throat> OK, so um, today I'm going to tell you a bit about genes, as is uh, the assignment. Uh, I, I wasn't sure about the, the level of um, well, pre-knowledge, so some stuff might be a bit complicated, but let's, let's, let's see. So before we talk about ALS genes, we have to talk about this term, genetic architecture. So what's, what does it mean? So it means what kind of genetic variation or mutations drive disease, and that's not always the same. Alzheimer's disease has a different architecture than multiple sclerosis, than ALS, than, than other diseases. And that's very important if you start studying the genetics of a disease because it really guides you in the way you, you study and which technologies you use and, and how big your data will be. So this is the old way of thinking. So we used to think, oh wow, this is cool. So we used to think that, okay, so if you have a genetic variation, a, gen a genetic variant in your genome, it can be shared among many people, so it's common. So it's over here. So it's very, very common, so we all have specific variants that we share, and we call them SNPs. They have a very small effect uh, on, 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 on an animal or a human, and, and so clinically it's not so, so useful, not so interesting. It's like these, these really tiny effects. So it's a bit boring, to be honest. Uh, and then you have these rare variants that have a huge effect, these, these mutations, like the, the, these lead to congenital diseases, like Duchenne or SMA or Huntington, whatever, it can also be late onset, but these huge effect genes that are, are rare. And so we used to think that familial ALS, like FALS, was here, and that sporadic ALS was here. So sporadic ALS was supposed to be this complex version where environmental factors and many SNPs would interact, and then you would get sporadic disease. And, 
And if you had a, this pedigree of patients, then you would have this rare, super, super penetrant, super potent uh, mutation. We now know that's not true. Okay, so, so this is the classical way of thinking. So this is what we know. So this is like the, the CNR of the SOD1 or SOT1 uh, and, and FAS and TARDDP. And, and then the rest is supposed to be, well, maybe this complex, tiny effect, you know, all these tiny, tiny pieces of the pie that, that, that's supposed to determine sporadic ALS. So that's, that's the, the old way of thinking. And so if you study SNPs, like common variants or rare variants, and that's SNPs, SNVs, then you have different technologies. So, so you have these glass tiles, and those are, are, there are probes on these glass tiles, and you can interrogate your genome for SNPs, and it's 30 euros per sample, it's cheap, small data, it's easy, but you only get information about these, these SNPs, these common variants, these complex, tiny things. And then if you, if, you, if you want to know things about mutations, like rare variants that are unique to one person or one pedigree or one family or one region or one country, then you need to do a whole genome or exome sequencing. So, and that's, that's okay, it's getting cheaper, but it used to be a thousand euros per sample, so, and, it, and it, it's way bigger data, of course, so you need larger computers and smarter people. Uh, and so, uh, you, you've, uh, Project Mind was already mentioned, so this is, this is an international collaboration. Spain is also part of Project Mind, um, which is really, really nice. So it's 21 countries now, and so we've managed to sequence now over 10,000 uh, subjects. And, and we're, uh, so as you can see, the growth of Project Mind. So it started roughly around here, roughly around the time of the Ice Bucket Challenge, remember that one? Uh, so that, that really allowed us to sequence lots of DNA samples. And you see it's growing, all this whole genome sequencing. And this other line is these, these cheaper GWAS studies with the, with the glass tiles. Uh, you can see the numbers are bigger because it's cheaper, uh, but the information you get is less, uh, well, granular, less detailed. So, so there's a drawback. And so this is the latest uh, publication where we released uh, a data freeze two of Project Mind. So that's, that's roughly 7,000 genomes, uh, but also 30,000 pa ALS patients uh, genotyped on GWAS arrays, and these cheaper arrays. So and what we found, and that's, uh, that's very um, crucial, is that uh, if you look at the risk for ALS, you take all patients, familial, sporadic, you take them all, and, and, you, and you see, okay, are these SNPs important or are these rare mutations important? You can see here that we've contrasted it to schizophrenia, which is a typical SNP disease. It's a complex disease, it's very difficult. Uh, and you can see that common variants are very important. These red bars are pretty high. And then you can see the skewed bars over to the left in ALS. So that, that means that rare genetic variants, rare mutations are more important in all ALS. And that's a very profound um, uh, finding, since it really governs the way how you do research. So we should forget about these cheap arrays, these, these glass tiles, and focus on these individual mutations. Uh, and so probably it's not this, file cells, but it's probably some, something in between. So that most patients are in between, like, like not super rare, not super common mutations, not super strong mutations with, that always lead to disease, since they're sporadic, of course, but but maybe, uh, but, but, sti but still way more potent than these, these tiny effect steps. So th this, is, this is one of the important messages that we, we get from Project Mind. So we need to find these things. So the pie chart needs to be filled in. So this is not true. So we're not interested in all these SNPs. We're interested in all these tiny uh, or rare variants that, that really describe one subgroup of patients, 1%, 2%, 5%, half percent with a, pretty strong mutation, and I think it's a message of hope because it means there's a targetable gene. There's maybe something we can target and you know, design therapies against instead of these, you know, these SNPs, this complex pattern. If you decipher this complex pattern, then what's, what's your treatment? Nobody knows, that it's really difficult. So I think this is a message of, of hope. And so where are we then in filling in this pie? Well, we, we've come a long way already since 2020 and 21 when, when we released Data Freeze 2, these 7,000 genomes. Uh, we've assembled all the data that's out there that's available since there are more groups doing whole genome sequencing and we don't work alone. We work you know, together with other people internationally and we don't want to duplicate unnecessary 
uh, stuff, of course. So we've uh, managed to also uh, acquire these data sets uh, that are out there uh, and combine it with, uh, with, our, with our own, with, with like the consortium uh, data. And so, so we now have over 14,000 full genomes of ALS patients from various countries. Uh, and, and less controls, of course, because we know that there are many control genomes out there that we can use, and it would be a waste of money to sequence many, many healthy people. Uh, but still, it's good to have because it allows you to find artifacts in the data. Um, so, lessons learned thus far. Uh, so, we now know that, that all ALS is genetic to some degree. It's not always familial, but it's genetic to some degree. Some have very, very strong mutations, some have less strong mutations, and that's why it's sporadic. Um, and it's mo mostly the rarer variants that are important, so we need the sequencing methods. Um, and since it's so heterogeneous, there's not one, one gene, there's not one, one easy, easy uh, cause, we need large sample sizes or maybe a, a, a somewhat clever approach, and I will end with the, the last one. So this is the message of hope, of course. To a person, this drug works. Uh, I'm not affiliated with Biogen in any way. I do work with them on sponsored research contracts, um, but um, the data is out there. These patients, not all, but some stabilize and improve in terms of functional outcomes. Um, and this is really spectacular and it really shows you that this disease in principle is treatable. We, we cannot see from the outside if, if a person has an SOD1 mutation, it's just ALS. So that's really, really spectacular. And so we, we need to fill in this pie chart with all these subgroups, with all these specific rare variants. And so this is our latest results. So um, instead of waiting for all the genomes to complete, which is costly and, and big data, uh, we sort of thought, well, let's use the older exome data. Our exome is 2% of our genome. Uh, and, and in the older days, people uh, did exome sequencing, which was then uh, the technology of choice. And so we, we've uh, combined the older exome data that's out there with whole genome data. So we take out the, the exome from genome data, which is just a computer a uh, act, uh, and then combine it with the, the actual exome sequencing data out there from control cohorts and other ALS cohorts. Uh, which is uh, a non-trivial thing to do because it's very noisy data, but we've managed to, to get it uh, uh, well-behaved, as we, we say in statistics. And so it's, again, almost uh, over 13,000 ALS cases and many more controls. These are all the cohorts that are included. And uh, this is unpublished work, by the way. Uh, and so what you can see is that we can, so this is a case control analysis. This is just look, not at pedigrees, but we, and we include every, every patient. It's familial, sporadic, it's just a, all ALS. And you can see we can rediscover familial genes, of course, like SOT1, and FUS, and KIF5A, the, the known ones. But we also see new ones coming up, quite some few, which we are replicating right now. We're trying to see if they're true, that these could be false positives. And, and if, you, if you have a slightly different approach, then you can see that there are some more new ones coming up, but also some, some rediscovery of known ALS genes, which is like a validation of the approach. So you don't need a pedigree to do this, uh, but we, we have the, the sample size is large enough to, to, to simply rediscover, for example, SOT1 or FUS. But also new ones, many new ones, and that's really nice. You can see, again, the allele frequency. So this, th these variants are 1% in the population, so not super common, but also not super rare. And this is the effect they have on humans. You can see the more rare that gets, the higher the effect is, like SOT1. So there are still quite some high effect novel ones out there that, that, that are quite interesting, I think, and, and those might, uh, as said before, uh, important <laughs> targets for new therapies. So I think that's, that's very exciting. So, yes, we're filling in this pie chart, uh, but it's, it's, it's way below 25% of the whole pie chart still. So there's lots of work to be, to be done. So what's then the other approach? I mean, I sh I've shown you these large case control studies. It's, it's, it's a bit, you know, it's, it's a very straightforward approach. It's, of course, it's technically challenging and also from bioinformatics standpoint of view, but, but it's a very simple approach, like healthy versus control. Uh, and, and since we know that rare variants are important, we know that there must be some familial uh, or the role for pedigree still out there. And what's, what's 
what's usually the, the problem with pedigrees in ALS is that you don't have DNA of several generations because it's a late onset disease, so the previous generation has already died. Um, and so, so, so you end up with one or two samples and then you, you really can't, don't know where to look. So what, what, we've, what we're trying to do now is, is instead look for these super pedigrees. So we link sporadic patients to each other. And we've, we indeed see if you take a random set of a thousand sporadic patients from Project Mind, you can see these links between, for example, this is a cluster. So these, these persons are maybe related in the third, fourth, or fifth degree. They don't know each other, of course. I, I don't know my fourth degree uh, nephew, whatever, what's it called. And so here's another cluster. And so that's, that's sort of interesting to see that these super pedigrees might exist. And if you have live patients and live relatives in several, um, well, components of a very broad pedigree, you, you might have more success in, in getting, getting new genetic causes, finding them. This is an example. For example, this is a sporadic patient, comes in the clinic, you do your family history, you know, no, no, it's a negative, okay. And then you do your due, you do genealogy or you do genetics and you can also do it in silico. And then boom, there's this uh, remote uh, relationship. And then, then this is an example of a super pedigree. You can see again, a sporadic patient, this is this, this probably, uh, this, this probably familiar of course, you can see you can link this sporadic patient to these family trees. So this is this one big uh, super pedigree where you can do your classical sort of linkage analysis again. So that's, um, that's what we're doing now. Instead of only getting more and more and more cases and, and, and these huge cohorts trying to get these super pedigrees well phenotyped uh, and, uh, and genotyped, of course, with whole genome sequencing. And this is some other stuff we're doing. Uh, we're also looking at patients only. So we want to know what drives disease progression. It's not only the risk of disease. We also want to know which patients you know, decline fast and slow. That might be m way more important than, than the risk of disease. It sounds trivial, but it's hard because you, usually phenotypic data is not out there or available. So it, it's, uh, it's a lot of work to get those data sets together, the phenotype and the genotype. Uh, and, and we want to dive deeper into these uh, subdomains of genes to see if there are specific regions in a gene that, that typically stand out. Um, okay, and this is just, these are the final slides. Um, so this is sort of, I think, uh, a, a glance of the future. Uh, and Lorem is a foundation in the US. It's, it's raised by Stanley Crook, who was the former CEO of Ionis and founder of Ionis. Um, so what they do is they uh, arrange for crowdfunding to treat maybe one or two patients with a specific mutation. Uh, using an antisense like Dofersen for SD1, but also for FUS, for example. And I think this is, this is a really a direction where we're going, where we treat one patient or one pedigree with a specific therapy. Um, and, uh, but, but there are quite some challenges since it's, it's risky business. You, you can't do a trial of a thousand FUS patients, so, so you have this pedigree, you have this antisense, and, and, and you, you need to know if it's toxic or maybe leads to detrimental effects. So it's, it's really an area where research and care sort of meet each other, but I think it is really where, where we're going. Uh, and so these are people that I work with and who actually do the work. Uh, some of you might know this guy over here, um, but uh, okay. And, and these three patients have been instrumental in getting Project Mind started. Uh, Bernard Muller still alive, Robert John Stuyt still alive, and Harmt uh, van Soest, who is deceased, unfortunately. Um, they have really uh, used their expertise um, from their profession uh, to, 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 to really help Project Mine uh, going. Gracias. <laughs> Questions now? Oh. Hi, uh, yes, maybe. Yeah. Uh, we have time for maybe two one or one or two questions. Well, many thanks, Professor Felding, for your lecture. Um, my question has to do with the um, sort of further along the results you, you have um, presented. For what I gather, you have uh, um, pinpointed a number of genes 
where mutations occur in comparison with the control population. Some of them are less frequent, very well known as SOD1. Others, I wasn't aware of them, are more frequent. Do you or do we have an idea what's the result of a mutation in those genes? What's the effect on the uh, gene product? Or, and what's the expression of these genes, nothing in the target um, tissues? To me, that would be the motor neuron um, in the spinal cord or the uh, um, cranial nerves or even in the, cort in, in the motor cortex. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so I think you're ex exactly uh, identifying the missing link between you know, genetics and going to a treatment, and that's uh, understanding what happens. So uh, do you have a toxic gain of function or a loss of function because of a mutation, for example? Well, that, that needs to be figured out, for example, with model systems. Um, like, like IPSC-based models from patients or, or uh, engineered mutations in cellular models and see if, if you can find a justification, uh, if there's a loss of function or a toxic gain of function, because that governs the way you attack those mutations. Do you downregulate it allele specifically or the whole gene, or do you sort of do a gene replacement uh, action? But what we thus far see is that most mutations in ALS seem to have at least a toxic gain of function. Uh, maybe C9 is a bit a bit of both, um, so so most likely it's 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 it's, it's usually a missense mutation, so amino acid change leading to a different protein, leading to some toxic new property. Uh, but you're right; that's that those are crucial questions that that need to be figured out before we start giving treatments to patients based on on mutations. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yes. A nice talk. Thank you. So I was wondering because. When you are trying to do this mine project, you are trying to define the gene consequences that could be behind these sporadic cases, yeah. right? But you cannot, or they are not related to sporadic mutations, right? Uh, sorry, the last sentence? Is it? So I, I am wondering whether these sporadic cases are also related to sporadic mutations. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, no. Um... Okay, so we've, okay, so you're you're referring to de novo mutation essentially. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we've actually we've looked at that together with uh, with a German group and uh, an Italian group uh, to see if there is evidence for de novo mutation. We looked in I think 175 trios, so young patients with their parents, and we don't see uh, a huge uh, effect of de novo mutations in ALS, for unlike for example in autism or, or other mm -hmm. other traits. Uh, but you're right, we strictly don't know if these mutations are de novo, that, because we don't have the, the parents, of course. Uh, but if you were to say, would you bet your money on you know, de novo mutations, would be, which is not to say that uh, what's still underexplored is like true somatic mutations in the brain, for example. That's, that's a whole different topic that might, yeah. that might be very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So we start Project Mind all over with brain genomes. Hard. Okay. <coughs> Uy, perdón. Bueno, una vez. Eh... Okay, so we've already started our sessions with this uh, marvelous introduction to genetics in relation to SALS. Now, uh, Michael Benatar, but at this time, this is online because he couldn't be with us. And he is a professor of neurology and public science at the University of Miami, uh, president uh, of uh, Vice President of uh, Clinical Investigation, Translational Investigation of the Neurology Department, 
and he is uh, executive director of the ALS Center at the University of Miami. And he's well known for his pioneer work in the definition of the field of presymptomatic ALS, including the discovery of the first biomarker of presymptomatic disease, which has been fundamental for the design and initiation of the first pre-symptomatic ALS trial. And he's also been a leader in questioning the existing paradigms for preclinical therapeutic studies. And he has shaped the way we um, think of and use biomarkers in the development of therapies and trials. Uh, changing the way we design uh, those uh, trials. And he leads the pre-false study that was initiated in 2007 and the CREATE Consortium, a network of 35 centers around the development of therapies for ALS and uh, related disorders. And um, I think that uh, the connection is ready to hear Michael Benatar. Hi, Michael. Great, can you hear me? Yes, 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 sure. And you can hear okay, us? Thank you. Yeah? So you can, you can begin when you want. I can hear you, thank you. Thank you. It's your time. Perfect, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm sorry that it's virtual. I'm sorry that it's virtual and that um, I cannot be with you in person, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to join you and to um, share some thoughts with you um, about biomarkers as tools for um, helping us develop therapies for patients with ALS. Just that you know, I'm going to mute my uh, volumes so that I don't also hear the translation. Okay, so just um, briefly, these are some of my disclosures. Um, I do serve as a site investigator for some industry-sponsored trials, most recently by Biogen and Orphazyme. I also provide some consulting advice to pharmaceutical companies developing treatments, both for ALS and for myasthenia. And I have research funding from the NIH and several ALS patient foundations. So when we talk about biomarkers, one of the most important things, I think one of the most important concepts to take away is that we cannot and we must not think about biomarkers as monolithic entities or as a, a, a single idea. And I want to draw your attention to this resource called BEST, which stands for biomarkers, endpoints, and other tools, resources, which was co-developed by the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institutes of Health. Um, in the United States. And this was really an endeavor to harmonize terms and concepts as we think and work on biomarkers. And this approach recognizes several different types of biomarkers, which I've listed here. Diagnostic, monitoring, response, predictive, prognostic, safety, risk susceptibility, and also these things called surrogate endpoints. And I'm going to talk about some of these. I don't have enough time to talk about all of them, but we'll try to give you a sense as to those that I think, which types of biomarkers I think are most important and relevant to our advancing development of ALS therapies. So when we talk about biomarkers, there's this term that the FDA likes called context of use. And this really refers to the way in which the biomarker is being used. And here I'll start with the example of a diagnostic biomarker. And a diagnostic biomarker is used to detect or confirm the presence of disease. And here I've given you an example. We're measuring a biomarker in controls, for example, the biomarker level may be low. In ALS, the biomarker level may be high. And we're very interested in these test characteristics called sensitivity and specificity. So what proportion of people with ALS have an elevated level? What proportion of controls have a low level? And that's helpful in separating out these two populations and yields a diagnostic marker. I would argue that um, we have diagnostic markers already, sort of. Um, electromyography is a diagnostic biomarker that's used in the clinical arena already. But I would argue that diagnostic markers are not the kind of biomarker that we most need to advance therapy development for ALS. And the reason is because our biggest challenge currently is that there's a long diagnostic delay from when symptoms um, begin 
to when patients appear in the clinic. And by the time they appear to the neurologist, usually the diagnosis is very apparent. It's very obvious from the clinical evaluation. And the diagnostic markers would not address this challenge. So we need to address the social phenomenon in medicine of patients not coming to the expert soon enough. But that's a diagnostic marker. Here's another kind of biomarker called a predictive marker. And these are actually very important and already playing a role. So a predictive marker are markers that are used to identify people who are more likely than similar people without the biomarker to respond to a particular therapy. And in this example, the best example I can give you is a genetic mutation. And I'll give you the example of an SOD1 mutation that the presence of that genetic mutation tells us who is likely to respond to this antisense oligonucleotide tofersin, and it tells us who is not. And so this is incredibly valuable now, both in developing this treatment, but also in finding the patients who are most likely to benefit from it. What we don't currently have are predictive markers in people who, in whom we don't know the cause of disease. And as um, Dr. Veldink has explained, this is most often the case in people without a family history of disease. And so we currently lack these predictive markers, but I think they are urgently needed. Let's talk a little bit about prognostic markers. These sound like predictive, the words sound similar, at least in English, but they mean different things. A prognostic marker is something that we can use to identify the likelihood of some clinical event or disease progression in the future. And these are marks that we want to measure at the time of an initial evaluation, and they tell us something about the future, the rate or the speed with which disease will progress, for how long somebody will live without needing a tracheostomy or ventilatory assistance. And these can be very helpful because the disease course in patients with ALS varies enormously. And accounting for this variability through the use of a prognostic biomarker would make clinical trials more efficient and enable us to do more clinical trials with fewer numbers of people over a shorter period of time in order to accelerate the pace of therapy development. Here I've just shown you what the ALS functional rating scale, this common measure of functional decline as patients progress, what this looks like across um, a large number of patients. And you can see it's very, very varied. And the idea is, is that if we were looking at function, does a high level of the biomarker predict a slower decline and a, um, um, a lower level predict um, a different decline? And so knowing what the biomarker level is when we first see somebody that can predict that decline um, or that survival as shown here, that can be helpful um, in our clinical trial process. Another kind of biomarker is a biomarker known as a response biomarker. And this is a marker that shows us that a biological response has occurred in somebody who has been exposed to an, investiga an investigational agent or a treatment. And there are two types of response biomarkers. There are those that we call pharmacodynamic, that literally comes from pharmacology um, or drugs and dynamic changing. And it tells us the marker changes in response to a drug. And if we know more about how these response markers behave, maybe they can serve as surrogate endpoints. So I'll give you two examples. Here's a longitudinal biomarker where the levels are elevated in patients with ALS, but they stay stable over time. And you can see that if we were to give an experimental treatment and the level of the marker were to come down, then this would tell us that the experimental treatment is doing something. Here's another example of an ALS biomarker that's increasing over time. And if we were to give an experimental agent and we were to cause this to flatten or to plateau or even to come down, that too would tell us that there has been a biological response. And it's these sorts of response biomarkers that are so critically important to assisting us in the early and mid stages of drug development, what is often called um, phase two clinical trials. The last type of marker I want to talk about before getting into some of the specifics are what we call risk or susceptibility markers. And these are markers that indicate the potential for developing disease in someone who does not car currently have clinically apparent disease. And the two examples I'll give you here, again, one are genetic, but the other example is of NFL or neurofilament life. And here's what I'm showing you. Let me, well, let me start with the gene example. So if we know somebody carries a um, mutation in the SOD1 gene, 
or a repeat expansion in the C9 or 72 gene, we know that that person has a high likelihood in the future of developing ALS. And in that sense, the genetic marker is a risk or a susceptibility marker for developing disease. We've also found that neurofilament light, which changes over time in people, when that level is high, it tells us which of the people who don't currently have disease are going to go on to develop disease, shown in red, and those people who are not going on to develop disease, at least in the near term. And this sort of risk susceptibility marker really is absolutely essential if we want to think about very early intervention and potentially even to prevent disease in people who are at risk. And I would venture that the best way that we're going to be most successful in developing treatments for patients with disease or for ALS is if we can intervene early. I worry that historically we chronically intervene much too late. And I think these risk susceptibility markers are going to be key to changing that landscape. So let me then tell you a little bit about how I think the biomarker development process works. I think it broadly goes through three, maybe four stages. There's discovery. Then there's the analytic validation. And what that means is making sure that the biomarker that's been discovered, we understand how it behaves in the laboratory. What are the reagents we should be using? Um, can we freeze the sample, the biological sample, and thaw it and freeze it again? What are the impacts of things like this if it sits at room temperature? We have to understand how the test performs. Once we've done that, we then need to clinically validate the biomarker. And we need to do this in large, carefully defined clinical cohorts. We have to have well-defined standard operating procedures for how we collect the sample, how we evaluate people. And we need to begin to define this intended clinical use. Will this be a diagnostic? Will it be a prognostic? Will it be a response marker? And then at least in the US, although this is not commonly done, there is a process whereby one can approach the regulatory authorities, the FDA here, to make the case that this biomarker really is fit for the purpose that we've developed it for, and that they approve it for use in the drug development process. I would argue we don't always need this. If we've done these steps well, this may be sufficient. And we've seen from recent FDA decisions that it may be enough to get up to the point of clinical validation. Oh, I just wanted to say that this term validation is a noisy term. People use it very, fairly loosely. And I think it often encompasses all of these different elements or aspects um, of the development and validation process. So I wanted to say about neurofilaments, I'm sure you know something about this, but neurofilaments are major structural components of nerve cells. Think about them as the building blocks of the motor nerves that are what degenerate in ALS. And when motor nerves degenerate, this neurofilament is released into the spinal fluid, it's also released into the blood. There are different kinds of neurofilaments, there's light chain, there's heavy chain. I'm, I'm going to focus on light. And importantly, the assays developing these are very mature, they're very sophisticated, we can measure very low quantities, and we can measure it reliably in the laboratory. Um, and just a few words about the ways in which neurofilament performs, and there are many papers I could have pulled from to show you. Um, but just to show you here, and this is in blood, in plasma, amongst healthy controls, neurofilament levels are low, amongst people with ALS, they're high. Amongst people who have other neurological diseases, they're somewhere in between, but also elevated. We and others have shown that if you measure neurofilament initially, when the neurofilament level is low, people live for longer. When the neurofilament levels are high, the disease progresses much more quickly, and people reach the end of the disease much more quickly. It's a very useful prognostic marker. We've also shown, as have others, that neurofilament levels are very stable over time. They vary a lot between people. The people who got low levels are progressing slowly. The people with high levels are progressing quickly. But the levels themselves remain relatively stable over time. And it's because of this that we could use this as, as a response biomarker and show if we give a treatment and the levels go down, then the, then the treatment may be doing something. And indeed, that was what was done in Biogen's study of TOFOS. And here you can see that in the group that got the active drug, neurofilament levels come down by about 60%. And when the group on placebo go on to open label drug, the levels come down. And it was this observation that was so key, I think, in the FDA's decision to approve this drug, even though the trial missed its primary clinical endpoint. I don't want to give you the sense this was the only reason, but it was one of the key pieces of information. 
And then I'll show you some of our data looking at pre-symptomatic SOD1 carriers. These are people who have not yet developed disease. And this, let me just orient you. This is the time to or from disease onset, and time zero is when they develop ALS. And we can see when we measure the blood level of neurofilament, the neurofilament levels go up in the 6 to 12 months before people develop disease. And so in this way, neurofilament is also a risk susceptibility marker. And it was this observation together with Biogen's very promising drug that has enabled us to think about the ATLAS study, which is the first pre-symptomatic or ALS prevention trial. And I'll come to that in just a second. Just to say that changes in individual levels of neurofilament over time, there's some variability at an individual level. This may not yet be ready for people to use in the clinic to make treatment decisions. But at a group level in clinical trials, this does work very well. So let me just summarize in how we're thinking about neurofilament as a biomarker that we think can aid therapy development. So here's the neurofilament concentration. This is time. This is somebody developing disease clinically. This is when a diagnosis is made, and this is the end of disease. And I'm showing you three different curves, people with rapid progressive disease where neurofilament rises rapidly and plateaus at a high level, somebody where it rises much more slowly, um, plateaus at a lower level, and someone in between. And we know that at least in some people, neurofilament rises pre-symptomatically. It continues to rise early in the course of disease and then plateaus. And so this increasingly makes us think that neurofilament is like the speedometer on your car when you're driving. It tells you how fast you are driving. What's the speed that you're going? But it does not tell you how many miles you've driven or how much distance you've traveled. Because neurofilament is the same level here early in disease as it is late in disease. So it's not a marker of disease progression, but it is a marker, right, that it's higher if you're progressing faster and you have a shorter survival. So let me finish up just by telling you then about this ATLAS study. So we've taken these observations that people with SOD1 mutations are at elevated lifetime risk of disease and that their neurofilament levels go up before they develop disease and that first is this very promising drug and we want to try to give it to people much earlier. So in part A of ATLAS, we enroll people and we follow them every month with a home measurement of neurofilament um, um, that, that phlebotomist goes out to their home and sends to us for analysis. When the neurofilament level goes up and they still don't have disease, they go into the clinical trial part where they randomized one to one in part B to receive placebo or to receive tofus. And then if they develop clinically manifest disease, that's the end point of the trial. And then they go on to the open label drug. If people develop disease without a rise in neurofilament, they go on to the drug. So the latest anybody receives the drug in this scenario, in this trial, is at the point of developing clinical signs of ALS. But we're also finding a way to give people the drug in the clinical trial months or a year or more before they develop disease based on a rise in neurofilament. And our hope is, is that we can show that we can delay the onset of ALS, perhaps even um, um, prevent it. And what's exciting is that this trial will hopefully provide the FDA with the confirmatory evidence that they need that tofersum works. Right now in the US, this has what's called accelerated approval, meaning additional data is needed for full approval. And we're hoping that this trial will be able to provide that additional information. So I'm going to stop there and hope I've left enough time for us to take some questions. Um, thank you very much. We have time for one or two quick, quick questions, if you have. Please, there. Can you hear us, Michael? Yeah? I didn't hear. Can you repeat the question for me? Hey, no, no, no. Don't well, worry. in fact, I haven't formulated no. oh, yet. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm Juan La Huerta, I'm a neurologist. Um, thank you very much for your informative talk. And I have a, a, a couple of very quick questions, hopefully. First one, do we have any idea of the um, sensi sensitivity and specificity of uh, um, light neurofilaments in ALS? And how, how do they compare? Um, and and the, other, the other question has to do drawing from other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's. 
um, do we have or are we looking for any uh, clinical, digital perhaps, um, biomarkers or neuroimaging markers or uh, neurophysiological markers? You mentioned EMG in ALS. Yeah, two great questions. Thank you. Let me try to answer quickly. In general, we think neurofilament light outperforms um, phosphorylated neurofilament heavy in just about every respect, at least in the blood. In spinal fluid, they may be more comparable um, in the value that they add. But of course, spinal fluid, as you know, is so much more difficult to get on a regular basis. So I think increasingly the field believes, and I certainly do, um, this is an idea we've pushed for a long time, that neurofilament light is going to be more helpful um, as a risk susceptibility marker, as a prognostic marker, and as a response marker. So I think um, for all three of those scenarios. To the second question, I think you're right that there's a lot of work being done to try to develop other markers. And people have looked at imaging measures, electrophysiological measures. And I think that that work still will continue. But increasingly, I think that the future lies in the biofluid markers. And the reason I say that is because of their the precision with which they can be measured. So if I measure it and you measure it and somebody else does, the results all agree. When we do an electrophysiological measure, say like motor unit number index, the test re test re vari variability can be as high as 15 or 20 percent. For neurofilament, it's two or three percent. So that makes the test intrinsically a much more robust test. The other problem we've observed in some of the imaging markers is that they're much more helpful at a group level than they are at an individual level. And you will appreciate, for example, in Atlas, we're making individual decisions about an individual person based on their neurofilament level. And none of our imaging or electrophysiological markers have yet reached that level of sophistication or maturity to enable us to do that. So I think there's still a ways to go there. I wouldn't give up, but I don't think they've reached sort of prime time yet. Well, another question, maybe later in the round table. Okay, thank you, Michael. We are going thank forward. Um, now is the time of uh, Axel Freshmet, no? <laughs> um, Dr. Axel Freshmet, his research work comes from the Ulm University in Germany. His research from the neurology department centered in epigen genetic, epigenetic, and molecular mechanism of the ALS using the complete egg sequencing of the exome of patients with ALS with family history to identify new genes and variants of the disease. And they are also interested in the later effects of those genetic mutations and also in the functional consequences of the genetic disorder, epigenetic disorders in order to better understand the pathogenesis of ALS. One of the great achievements was the finding of the TBK1 gene as an new causing agent of the ALS and frontotemporal dementia both uh, in both symptomatologies. His research is also focused on the role of the microRNAs in the development of ALS. Hello? Ah, okay. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and of course, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to participate in this meeting. Um, I would like to start with... Ah, um, with my favorite de definition of the term epigenetics, that states epigenetics refers to both the heritable changes in gene activity and expression, either in the progeny of cells or of individuals, but also to stable long-term alterations in the transcriptional potential of a cell that are not necessarily inheritable. So, in short, epigenetics... Uh, how did you point that? Ah, okay, it's a little bit slow. Okay. 
So in short, epigenetics um, refers to relatively stable changes in gene expression. If these changes are heritable or not is another story. So epigenetic mechanisms can either work on DNA or on RNA. Um, the uh, mechanisms that work on DNA um, comprise the well-known DNA methylations or chromatin modifications but also the action of um, long non-coding RNAs, and all the mechanisms that are acting on DNA um, have an effect on transcription of genes. Besides these DNA-related mechanisms, there are also mechanisms that work on RNA molecules. For example, there are the small microRNAs that, determer, that determine the mRNA stability and also the translation of mRNAs. And there are um, chemical modifications of um, RNA molecules that can have various effects. Um, to make a long story short, all of these mechanisms have been implicated in ALS so far. And in the following, uh, I um, selected some of the most important studies of the, or in the field of epigenetics in ALS that quite well summarize our current knowledge in this field but also highlights the challenges, the challenges that are associated um, with epigenetics research. The major challenge, I can tell you now, is that it's always very difficult to differentiate cause from consequence, and it is also very difficult to determine when in the pathogenic cascades of ALS these changes occur. So I start with um, DNA methylation in blood. And here, the largest um, epigenome-wide um, association study in ALS was carried out by Jan, who just talked. And um, they compared the um, DNA methylation in blood cells from thousands of controls and ALS patients, and thereby they found 45 differential, differentially methylated positions in, more, in 42 different genes that were associated with the disease. Interestingly, um, these genes are enriched in genes with functions in well-known ALS traits, such as metabolism, cholesterol biosynthesis, or immunity. And five of these differentially methylated um, positions were also associated with the progression of the disease. I think this study um, leaves little doubt that DNA methylation is of relevance in, AL in ALS, and that differences are even detectable in blood. However, um, this study does not um, give information about the causality of these differences. So we don't know, does the ALS phenotype induce these differences, or do these differences induce the ALS phenotype? Um, we recently um, tried to address the question if differences in DNA methylation are already detectable in presymptomatic um, mutation carriers. And therefore, we also used blood samples and um, generated the DNA methylation profiles. And then we used um, a machine learning approach to create a model that can separate um, sporadic ALS patients from controls according to the DNA methylation. And this um, model worked quite well, and it worked for sporadic ALS patients and for familial ALS patients. However, when we tried to predict the phenotype of presymptomatic carriers of um, ALS mutations, all but one were classified as healthy. So um, we can conclude that um, the ALS phenotype most likely has a larger impact on blood DNA methylation than causative ALS mutations, and there are no pronounced differences before the um, onset of symptoms. However, this does not mean that DNA methylation is not very relevant in ALS. Recently, it has been shown um, in iPSC-derived motor neurons that represent a likely very early or even presymptomatic uh, model of the disease that a considerable proportion of um, differentially expressed strand transcripts can be tracked back to differential DNA methylation. So DNA methylation may, of course, be of relevance also in the presymptomatic um, stage of ALS, but um, this is most likely more restricted to the CNS. Um, next, there are the chromatin modifications, and the way how the DNA is packaged into the nucleus can determine if genes are rather accessible for transcription or not. And this is determined um, largely by the expression of dis different um, histone variants 
and by, the, by multiple post-translational modifications in the tails of these histones. However, unfortunately, um, there are no high throughput methods available yet that can um, read this so-called histone code um, genome-wide and at the, with a resolution of individual genes. However, um, to overcome this problem, um, a special sequencing method has been um, developed, and this is attack sequencing. And by using this sequencing technology, it's possible to um, sequence the open chromatin that is most likely transcriptionally active from the closed chromatin that is tightly packed and mo most likely not accessible to the transcriptional machinery. And by using this technique, we of course get no information about the histones or something, but of we can um, determine which genes are potentially accessible for transcription and which are not. So this method was used in um, blood samples from ALS, ALS patients recently, and here the authors found that more than 600 genes show differential accessibility in ALS. And um, what is quite interesting is, is that these genes are enriched in genes with a neuronal function, irrespective if they are um, expressed in blood or not. Um, these 600 genes, genes with differential accessibility significantly overlap with ALS GWAS genes identified before, and the um, accessibility of a specific module of these genes also correlated with the age of, age of onset of the disease. Um, then, in postmortem brain tissue from ALS patients, another group combined these attack sequencing with transcriptomics at the, um, with a single cell um, resolution, and here the authors found that, for example, in astrocytes or in spe specific inhibitory neurons, the differentially expressed genes indeed correlate with differences in the accessibility of the DNA. What we learned from these studies is that ALS may at least partly be some kind of imprinted in the chromatin, uh, in the chromatin accessibility, and this is even evident in blood cells. And um, this also suggests that these chromatin modifications may be of functional relevance in ALS, but here too, similar to the methylation profiles, we can um, make no conclusions about the causality of these changes. Uh, next, there are the RNA modifications, and here a very prominent modification is the A2I editing by ADA2. ADA2 um, is a specific enzyme that catalyzes the post-transcriptional deamination of specific adenosines in RNA, and this results in the creation of an inosine. These inosines, in turn, are recognized by the cellular machinery, for example, by RNA-binding proteins or by also by the ribosome, are recognized as a guanosine. So these um, editing changes are found almost everywhere in RNA molecules, and they can have multiple effects. They can cause binding of differential RNA binding proteins, have um, effects on RNA stability, on alternative splicing, and more. Some of these changes also introduce amino acid changes in the encoded proteins. Um, this modification has recently been uh, studied, again, in postmortem tissue from C9 ALS patients. And in the CNS tissues, they found widespread A2E editing defects in C9 ALS. Interestingly, the transcripts affected were related to ALS or pathways that are related to ALS. And um, these defects could be tracked back to um, the cytoplasmic mislocalization and aggregation of the re responsible enzyme ADA2, here shown um, from a spinal cord sample. Interestingly, um, the mislocalization of ADA2 um, was already evident in iPSC-derived motor neurons, suggesting that they actively contribute to the disease. Um, when talking about this A2I editing, um, one specific site has been extensively studied in the last 20 years, and this is the so-called 2R editing site of the GLU-A2 subunit of AMPA receptors. Here, um, the codon for glutamine is edited, what results in a codon coding arginine. 
And this editing is very important because it determines um, the calcium permeability of these AMPA receptors. And we all know increased calcium is bad for neurons. So in healthy individuals, almost 100% of these GLUA2 subunits are edited, but editing defects has been detected in sporadic LS. This is shown down here. In laser dissected motor neurons from ALS patients, the editing is reduced, but only in motor neurons, not in um, cells that are less affected in ALS, for example, the Purkinje cells. Here too, um, these uh, changes have been tracked back to aberrations of ADA2, and in this study, the authors found that um, the expression is lost of ADA2 in spinal cord tissue, but only in those neurons that show TDP43 pathology. So, of course, we don't know if TDP43 pathology induces the loss of ADA2 or if the loss of ADA2 induces TDP43 pathology, but I think this is a very interesting result. More results about um, this specific editing size um, were achieved in mice. For example, ADA2 knockout mice show a progressive loss of motor neurons coupled to um, worse motor performance. However, when these mice are genome edited in a way that they only express the edited version of the GLUA2 subunit, this motor phenotype and the loss of motor neurons is fully rescued. So, despite widespread RNA editing changes in ADA2 knockout mice, rescuing a single site is sufficient to prevent motor symptoms in mice. Unfortunately, there's no data available about rescuing this editing site in ALS model mice, but nevertheless, there are currently therapeutic approaches tested that aim at either restoring the expression of ADA2 or at improving the editing efficiency of the GLUA2 QR site. Last but not least, there are the microRNAs, and our group um, some years ago studied circulating zero microRNAs in sporadic ALS patients, in familial ALS patients, and in preclinical mutation carriers. And thereby, we made two observations. The first one is um, that we could identify only a single microRNA that is downregulated in all symptomatic ALS. So it's downregulated in all sporadic ALS and in all familial ALS, irrespective of the underlying disease cause. And the second observation was that we could identify a subset of 19 microRNAs that were downregulated in all F, uh, familial ALS cases in about 60% of sporadic ALS patients, and it was already downregulated in presymptomatic carriers um, of ALS mutations. Um, the most striking finding here was that almost all of these microRNAs comprised the sequence motif shown here. So 18 of 19 microRNAs had the sequence motif that is normally very rare in microRNAs. I think less than 3% have this sequence motif. Um, we then followed up both of these findings, and for microRNA 1825, we could show that um, this microRNA is downregulated systemically, including the CNS. And when we identified the targets of this microRNA, we found um, that one of the main targets is TBCB, that is a tubulin cofactor required for folding of the tubulins. And lower levels of microRNA 1825 induced higher levels of TBCB, and um, higher levels of TBCB in turn induced the depolymerization and degradation of TubA4A, what is a established ALS gene, and led to less stable microtubules and also axonal pathology in vivo. Um, importantly, we could find all um, components or the expected changes in all these components in postmortem cortex to tissue of familial and sporadic ALS patients, patients um, exactly as it was expected. So we have downregulation of the microRNA, upregulation of TBCB, and downregulation of TUB-A4A. This surely broadens the relevance of um, TUB-A4A from some very rare familiar cases to most likely all ALS cases. Um, the second finding we also followed up, so the, micro, the downregulated microRNAs with this motif. 
Um, here we hypothesized that these short sequence um, may represent the binding site for RNA binding proteins and identified um, RNA binding proteins that are binding to these microRNAs. And here we ended up with the fragile X protein family. And when we stained this protein family in postmortem spinal cord tissue, um, we found aberrant expression and um, aggregation of these proteins in the motor neurons. And this, again, similar to the findings from serum, was independent of the underlying disease. So we saw it in FAS ALS, C9 ILF, and also in sporadic ALS. Very recently, we also got microRNA data from iPC-derived motor neurons. And here, too, no matter at which uh, mutation we look, we always um, see this enrichment of these microRNAs with this motif among the downregulated microRNAs. And the next step we're taking here now is we're trying to identify upregula uh, upstream regulators of these microRNAs. So what we learned from these studies is that microRNA changes in blood are most likely systemic, and they can be indicative for pathogenic mechanisms in the CNS. Then, in case of the microRNAs with this motif, um, these changes were evident long, long before symptom onset, in some cases, cases up to 20 years. But at the moment, we still don't know if these microRNAs contribute to the disease or what they are doing. So, in summary, I think these studies show that epigenetic mechanisms are definitely involved in ALS pathogenesis. But for the hundreds and thousands of, of changes we see, only very few um, has been studied in detail, and it is known if they contribute to the disease or not. So here we are clearly just at the beginning. Then I think that most epigenetic mechanisms should be suitable for therapeutic interven intervention. And the big advantage is that when you rescue um, the whole mechanism of or a whole epigenetic mechanism, you most likely um, rescue expression of hundreds of downstream targets from that mechanism. However, I think it's too early to talk about therapeutic intervention because there are many open questions. One is, is really everything what we see pathogenic or are, is a lot of what we see also protective or compensatory mechanisms of the cell. So just an example, when we now will try to rescue the expression of these microRNAs with this motif, we cannot be sure that this will improve the phenotype. Maybe we make everything worse because it is a compensatory mechanism, so we don't know. I think there's lots of trial and error here. Then, next question that brings us back to the question from the beginning is very important. When do these changes occur? Are many of them already present from birth and largely defined by genetics? Are they acquired during life? Are they induced by the ALS phenotype? Are they static or other dynamic? We don't know. The last question is what I think was clear um, when showing the mechanisms that um, are associated with epigenetics is, is ALS maybe more homogeneous at the level of epigenetics and consequently downstream of proteomics? than suggested by all the multiple mRNA sequencing studies carried out before, where we find almost no overlap um, downstream of different ALS genes. So for the future, I think, um, future directions for epigenetics research is very similar to um, other areas of research in ALS. We need definitely more functional studies. Then we need uh, more multi-omics profiles from the same samples. At the moment, most of the time, we just uh, concentrate on transcriptomics or proteomics only. But if you combine these profiles also with epigenetic profiles, we may not only see that something is changed, but maybe we can see for why it is changed. Then, of course, as usual, we need more longitudinal studies and um, because of the epigenetics findings, we also need more comparative studies that compare the downstream effects of different ALS genes. So that's it from my side. In the end, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues in Ulm and the collaborators elsewhere. Of course, I'd like to thank my whole group that's doing all the work, our sponsor, and you for the attention.
Uh, now we have time for one or two questions, maybe. No? If you don't have, uh, we are going to be on a round table later, uh, 15 minutes from. Um, well, we are going to begin a round table uh, between the previous speakers and new ones. Maybe people is coming to the, to the room. <laughs> uh, Michael, can you hear us? Yeah? Are you okay? <laughs> Me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to present the new uh, researchers from Spain. Uh, we have three researchers from uh, different uh, parts of Spain. Uh, Ana Cristina Calvo Royo, professor of the Department of Anatomy and Biology and Animal Genetics at the University of Zaragoza. Her research line within the group TeraGen focused around looking for prognostic biomarkers in animals and in samples of ALS patients. In 2014, she coordinated a, an article on, in the journal BioResearch International. Ana Cristina. Uh, gene therapy and biomarkers, the prognostic biomarkers there with the animal model G93A study one. Uh, el segundo es, uh, bueno, uh, el doctor Juan Francisco. Dr. Juan Francisco Vázquez Costa, coordinator of the unit of motor neuron diseases at Hospital La Fe in Valencia, associated professor of neurology at the University of Valencia. He's a researcher in ataxia at NMA and health care research at Hospital La Fe. And he's worked in research in NMD. Is working in a hospital in Valencia, La Fe, and uh, he is leading a work a group in uh, neuromuscular pathology and ataxia. Um, the third one, el tercero es Paul Andres Benito. Paul Andres Benito, researcher in the group of neurologic disease and neurogenetics at Belviche, Barcelona. His line of research within the group is focused on new prognostic biomarkers in neurological diseases, diagnosis of uh, uh, diseases underlying neurodegenerative disease. And he is working in Barcelona in the Hospital de Belviche, where uh, Monica Povedano, maybe you know Monica, uh, is the leader of the team. Uh, he works in a diagnostic biomarkers and prognostic biomarkers of neurological diseases. So we can start with several uh, themes and maybe, uh, all right, I have prepared several themes, okay? And the first one about genes, um, about uh, how whole genome uh, sequencing can nowadays be done uh, quite easily, quite cheaply, not very, very expensive now, no? But the drawback is the complexity of processing the results obtained from such sequencing. This requires complex systems for handling huge databases and a deep knowledge of computer science and biology. Are uh, you considering in Project MIND to use uh, artificial, in artificial intelligence? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I think there are several uh, components to that question. Uh, so, okay, first, sequencing, sequencing is getting cheaper. It's getting cheaper, yes, but it's not so cheap as we would have hoped. Um, so we hope that maybe one genome will be 200 euros soon, but it's still maybe 400 euros. And 
Uh, maybe in the US it's 350 US dollars, whatever, depending on who you talk to. But hopefully they will, will, it, it will fall um, <clears throat> further uh, because of the new technology. Okay, so um, second, um, the limitation for research is not uh, computing or knowledge or computer scientists. I mean, we have big enough computers to deal with even bigger data. Uh, so that's, I think that's also quite clear. And then the last part is, of course, AI. Okay, I did, and this is probably the most frequently asked question about Project Mind, if are you using AI because it will solve everything, and it might. And yes, we do use AI a lot on several uh, levels. Uh, one by, for example, uh, reanalyzing uh, GWAS data and looking for these interactions between SNPs and maybe combined they have a larger effect looking for these networks. Uh, thus far, it hasn't been that successful, to be honest, but there are lots of people uh, trying to get uh, neural networks working on GWAS data. And then second, and that's hugely successful, is AI is being used to predict parts of our non-coding genome. So our genome is three billion uh, base letters, base pairs. Uh, Two percent is the exome, so that codes are uh, like the proteins. Ninety-eight percent is the junk, whatever, or the regulatory genome, and that's very hard to uh, to understand. And AI comes in in the ninety-eight percent of the non-coding genome, so you can predict if a sequence has a consequence on protein function or RNA function, or if it's an open chromatin, uh, like uh, Axel showed, like the epigenetic uh, phenomenon. You can predict based on sequencing if this person would have open chromatin in a neuron there or not. So, so you don't need ataxic then maybe at some point or other layers. Uh, so you can simply look at the DNA sequence and use AI to predict if it's a functional relevant part of your genome. So yes, we're using AI, um, but it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's, it's not an easy fix for complex problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It is becoming increasingly clear that in complex diseases such as ALS, the genetic factor is very relevant and uh, can be considered decisive in the developing phenotype. No? To what extent, all of you, uh, do you think that, uh, can we assume that individual genetics gives rise to the disease according to current knowledge? Yeah, so, so essentially the question is, um, so to, to what degree uh, is in every patient is the disease genetic, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a difficult question, of course. Um, so, so I said, so I, I think genetics plays a part in every patient, even if it's sporadic, um, and, uh, but, uh, but to a varying degree. So we now have a paper under revision where we even re-evaluate the penetrance, or like the chance you get disease of C9 orf mutation. People think that the C9 orf mutation is a Mendelian Mutation, so you always get disease, ALS or FTD, while in fact it's not the case. The frequency of CNNORF in the general population is way too high, uh, then ALS and FTD would be way more common. Um, so even for, for a mutation like CNNORF, there's this um, well, level of uncertainty if you really get, uh, always get the disease. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, uh, so even in sporadic disease you can have these uh, well, severe mutations that, that, that can drive disease while well, it appears to be non-genetic maybe because it's sporadic. But the exact amount, yeah, that, that's hard to give, of course. I mean, yeah. It's very difficult to know everybody yeah. is yeah. genetic. And how, how many ALS genes are there? Is it 200? Is it 300? Is it 100? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I also think I agree with you because uh, I think it's a very hard question to to tackle, yeah. but I think the, the main point is that uh, now we can define this thin line that can separate ALS from other motor neuro, neuromuscular diseases, and this is a very good point because we have more technologies, more approaches we can um, en enroll to, to discover not only genes, but also as we have mentioned during this uh, exciting um, uh, meeting, uh, all these players that are not uh, messenger RNAs, mm -hmm. other players that take place in this activation, this activation of the genes, and I think it's a very, very good, uh, ambitious and, and very good point to, to think about it. So yeah. I think we are a little bit closer to, to solve this question. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, my concern, uh, my concern 
question is that uh, we all know that genetics have advanced a lot and very fast in the last year. We are producing a huge amount of, of data, uh, much larger than we are available to translate it into the clinical practice. So as a clinical neurologist, difference between what's going on on genetics, what does it mean for in Spain, many patients don't have access to it at all. And um, okay. <laughs> so uh, I said in Spain, many patients don't have uh, access to genetics for several reasons. And in those centers where we perform uh, genetic studies, we have a lot of problems to uh, interpret the results. And you were, you were commenting on C9R72, for example. Um, this is the most frequent co genetic cause of ALS. And we still don't know the penetrance. So we cannot make a proper uh, genetic counseling for the families. So yep. this, is, this is critical. And uh, for example, with SOD1 mutations, we have a, many SOD1 mutations that we still don't know if they are pathogenic or not. So we, we don't know if we should treat these patients or not. Uh, so I see this huge difference between the, you know, uh, sequencing 10,000 genomes, but uh, on the other way, the clinic is so behind. Um, can you comment on this? And how yeah. can we? Yeah, that's, that's a true, true and fair point. Um, especially with SOT1, it's an issue. Now there's a treatment, I mean, yeah. I mean, who should we treat the top person? Um, any mutation is not one, probably not. And also we need more predictive tools um, to interpret these mutations that are probably, and they need, need to be ALS specific. We, we cannot rely on general genetic guidelines or criteria of variant of unknown significance, blah, 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 blah. So there are several initiatives. For example, there's this GSEP initiative where, you know, where, where these ALS mutations and genes are carefully curated based on on careful literature review, that I think that, that's a very useful effort. Uh, but we also need predictive model systems. For example, in, in CF, in cystic fibrosis, um, you, you, you can puncture a patient for a skin biopsy and then you can grow a mini gut. And, and if they have a chlor channel mutation that hasn't been seen before, and you want to know if some drug that you know, affects the chlor, uh, chloride uh, channel uh, will work in this patient. You do an assay, you, you, you generate diarrhea in a dish, or you throw in some, some toxin, and then you see if, if you get diarrhea. If you throw in the drug and it prevents the diarrhea, then you know it will work in this specific mutation. And we need these kinds of predictive <coughs> model systems in ALS, but we don't have them. It's, I mean, all the IPS cell models are so variable and so, so heterogeneous. So I think it would be really cool or nice to have this um, simple, in vitro model that sort of predicts if, if an antisense will work or whatever, or, yeah. Just, just one question. Yeah. Uh, are you being testing these variants or yeah. things, SNPs in animal models or this kind, just to see what happens when you have this variant? Yeah, but if, if, if you see, if, if the I'm patient sure. is alive, yeah, and sort of, if there's a new mutation and you don't know, for example, in SOD1 or another gene, and, and you have a model system that's consistent and reliable, and as an, uh, and you can you can grow the cells of this yeah. patient according but to those guidelines. In, in vitro model, but in vivo models. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if in vivo is uh, uh, is practical. I mean, it's, yeah, I know, I don't know, just to, a proof the, of com a proof of concept. You know what? I mean, in terms of you know getting a rapid result if a drug works. I mean, it would be nice to have a quick answer, of course, and not wait for months for a yeah. mouse to get some symptoms. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's lacking in the field. Yeah. Um, and it would be nice if several models in, in ALS, C9, first, at one, have a final common phenotype, we don't know, in yeah, vitro, yeah. Uh, that, that would help. So, so you know where to screen for, to look for in these models. I think these are open questions. And it could resolve the, the, your question about the clinical relevance of, of mutation. <laughs> Not sure if others have other ideas. Michael, what do you think? Hi, Michael. <laughs> uh, around the field of biomarkers, oh. <laughs> especially during the last decade, 
the number of studies related to the discovery of biomarkers has uh, multiplied exponentially in the world of medicine, generating what we all know as uh, personal medicine or precision medicine. No? In this field, the advances in cancer are spectacular, but in the field of neurodegenerative diseases, uh, there are still no translation into the clinic. No? There are not diagnostic or prognostic biomarkers that have improved classical clinical practice. I mean, a neurologist, her or himself, is good enough or even better than the biomarkers that are slowly coming onto the market. What could be the reason? So thanks for the question. I guess I want, to, I want your permission to edit the question. So firstly, I think, I think you're right that um, what we do clinically um, takes us a long way. But I think we increasingly do have biomarkers that are integrating into clinical practice. And it's because they've become so sort of um, commonly used that we don't think of them that way. EMG is one, genetics is another. Um, as um, Dr. Velding was saying, now that we have a treatment for patients with SOD1 disease, the presence of an SOD1 mutation tells us who's likely to benefit from that. And so we need to find ways to get routine genetic testing into the clinic so we can tell for you as an individual patient, should you be on this treatment? So that's one example. I think neurofilaments are making their way into the clinic. Recently within the US, I'm not sure what it's like in parts of Europe, this has now become a test that we can order clinically. That may be a little bit premature because it's not always clear how to interpret that, although as normative databases develop, we can better think about what a particular level of neurofilament means. Um, but this information is being integrated. You may be familiar, I think this group is, that there are um, prognostic models like the MCALS predictive model that tries to predict the future prognosis of patients, what will the course of disease be? And that relies primarily on clinical information, but integrates, for example, C9 of 72 status. Um, and we have some evidence, there may be others too, that neurofilaments add value to that model. And so I think that the biomarkers are making their way in. It's not as fast as we would like, but I think it's happening. Yeah, sir. Oh, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And I guess I would just add that for a biomarker to be useful, it must add value to what we can do clinically at the bedside, right? If you have to do a fancy, expensive test that requires, I don't know, CSF or a muscle biopsy, and all it tells you is what I could tell you at the bedside, it's not going to be a useful biomarker. So that's one of the bars that we have to overcome in terms of um, what we require from a biomarker for it to be useful. Yeah, that's the point. Well, and about a clinical trials such as uh, ATLAS may show the importance of treating the disease before symptoms start. Do you think preventive treatments will be the future of AS medicine? Um, so I'm biased, but I'm going to answer my way, and I want to hear what the other panelists have to say. I, I, I think absolutely. I think we're not ready for it yet, but that's where we have to be working towards. Again, if we look to sort of, you know, the, the, the cancer models or the cardiovascular disease, we try not to wait for you to have a heart attack or a stroke. We try to advise you to exercise, lose weight, stop smoking, lower your cholesterol. Um, and those things are far more effective at promoting cardio and cerebrovascular health than are treating people with secondary prevention after an event. And I think ALS, in a sense, is very much the same. We know that from when people develop symptoms, the diagnosis, there's about a year's delay, then there's a further delay before they get into a clinical trial or get onto established treatments. And so we're really intervening very late in the course of disease. And so I think we have to find ways to move that forward. The genetics is going to be a big foot in the door to help us do that. But as we're learning from studying some of these genetically at risk populations, we're just beginning to start to identify um, clinical markers and even maybe biomarkers, neurofilament might play a role in people who could be at risk for non-genetic forms of disease or non-monogenic forms of disease. And so I think we're at the early days for the non-genetic population, but I do think it's the future of where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, for those who don't think that that's um, realistic, 
I'll say we had the same criticism 15 years ago when we said we should do this in SOD1 disease, and now we're doing it. So fast forward 15 years, and I think we'll all be accepting it as a given, if not already. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, you Michael, um, about the TDP43 uh, specific biomarkers. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you are familiar with it, uh, but uh, we know how has changed the diagnosis, for example, of Alzheimer's disease once we had a specific amyloid biomarkers. And uh, there are several attempts to diagnose uh, also TDP43 uh, proteinopathies. Um, and since we know that this applies for practically 98% of ALS patients, but I, I don't know if this, should, this would be so useful as uh, amyloid for um, Alzheimer's, given the, uh, given that ALS is a much uh, faster uh, progressive disease. Um, so my question is, what do you think about these biomarkers, and how far are we for, uh, from having these kind of biomarkers for, for ALS? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think the, the broader point you're making is that the biomarkers we have are sort of non-specific. It's things like neurofilament, which reflect neurodegeneration, but aren't specific to the pathological sort of underpinnings or substrate um, for the disease. And since TDP43 pathology, as you say, is so common, what we really need is a marker of that underlying pathology. And I do think it's a critically important priority for a whole host of reasons. And I would say that progress there has not been as fast as we would like. But I do think there are many parallel efforts and there have been some very interesting and exciting new publications, for example, looking at the effects of TDP43 mislocalization from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and how that um, mediates or is, is measurable based on um, aberrant splicing and um, the revelation of these sort of neo or cryptic peptides that can then be detected as, um, um, as, as biomarkers. I think that's early days. We still need to see more of that work evolve. Um, there are people who are trying to, for example, measure TDP43 levels, not so much just in plasma or serum or CSF, but to isolate extracellular vesicles, for example, and to measure TDP43 um, in a subfraction of um, um, of, of a body matrix or fluid. And so I think this work is coming. There's also efforts on going to develop TDP43 ligands for um, PET imaging. Um, and so I think this will come and I think it will be valuable. But as with every other biomarker, we're going to have to figure out what its role is. Is it a diagnostic? Is it a prognostic? Is it a response marker? And as we discover the mark and then begin to understand it, we need to refine that and think critically about how it can best help us understand the disease and move treatments forward. Mm -hmm. Michael, I <laughs> sorry. No. Well, I have a question for Michael as well. Uh, Monica and I, in the lab, we usually ask about uh, how neurofilaments levels could be altered uh, in a phenotype-depending manner. I don't know if you have checked this, for example, because I, I don't understand ALS as a unique entity or as a unique pathological entity. It, forms, it is, belongs to a complex spectrum of uh, motor neuron diseases and also it's linked with uh, FTD. So did you check neurofilament levels in this spectrum in a phenotype-dependent manner or not? I'm not sure I understand the question fully, but let me try to answer. I mean, neurofilaments are elevated in a host of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, they're also elevated in FTD, for example, in Huntington's and other disorders, perhaps not to the same extent as ALS. You know, another disease with neurofilaments are very high are prion diseases. Um, and so I think the degree of elevation speaks not to specificity for disease, but to the aggressivity of the underlying degenerative or disease process. If it's an aggressive disease that's moving very quickly, um, we see much higher levels. If it's a much so, slower, okay. more indolent disease like CMT, for example, levels are only minimally or only intermittently elevated. But maybe I misunderstood the question. No, I, want, I wanted to say that, uh, for example, in base of what did you say? What did you say? Uh, PLS, for example, primary lateral sclerosis, must have lower levels than AM um, PMA. 
for example, or an aggressive form of ALS. Mm. No, I, I, want, I wanted to know uh, if you could be able to uh, categorize or set up so, some threshold levels in neurofilaments to differentiate between one phenotype or another phenotype. I, I, I would say no. Um, I think there's too much overlap. Um, between, think, okay, yeah. Oh, right. as, yeah, as you know, we have PMA patients who can move more quickly and ALS patients who can move more slowly. And so I don't think it relates to the phenotype of, for example, more upper or more lower motor neuron. I think it really just relates to the pace with which degeneration is proceeding. So in that sense, I don't think it's useful diagnostically. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been scare quotes. Thank you. Sure. It may also depend on where are you um, measuring the, the NFLs, because I think there is this publication that shows that uh, with uh, upper motor neuron predominant ALS or PLS, they have more increased uh, levels in, in CSF, where, while lower motor, neuro, uh, lower motor neuron impairment is, more, uh, uh, is better measured in, in serum. Uh, I don't know if you if you are aware of this publication. So it it also I, depends I am, on. I guess what I'm just. Sorry, forgive me. No, no, it it was just this comment. Yeah, no, I, I am familiar. I guess I'm just not entirely convinced by the data that's been published. Yeah. Michael, uh, my question was uh, in line with uh, Paul with the question of Paul. But I, I think, uh, I agree with you that the field of biomarkers is, uh, is very difficult because we have a, a wide variety, a wide range of biomarkers, different kinds, and even at the molecular level. But um, I, I would like to point uh, all of you uh, to catch your attention to one point that you have shown in, in one of your slides um, about neurofilaments that are related to the disease progression, but not with the, disease, with the severity of the disease. And I think this is very, very, a very important point because sometimes we can, um, we can have a mistake. We, we think, okay, this patient progressed faster, so uh, the severity is very high, and probably not. And uh, could you comment uh, a little bit more about this? How can you distinguish or how can you measure more efficiently at the clinical level at this? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great question. And I, I made that point and I appreciate your highlighting it because I think it's often misunderstood. And I do think okay. that the analogy to the, to the speeding car or putting yeah. your foot in the accelerator is a good one. You can be traveling 100 miles per hour at the beginning of your journey and you can be traveling 100 miles per hour at the end of your journey. And in this analogy, the beginning of your journey is early disease and the end of your journey is late disease. You can be going at the same speed and that's what neurofilament reflects. It doesn't tell you if you're, if you're at the beginning or the end of the journey. And so I think we have to be very careful that in terms of how we interpret the neurofilament result and what we communicate to people. And so I think if you do measure this and it's high, that tells us nothing about how far into the disease you are, but it does tell us something about how quickly or slowly you're likely to progress. How far into the disease you are, I think, is better done at the bedside from a history and examination, an ALS functional rating scale, a vital capacity. I think those bedside tools are much more helpful for that. I hope I addressed the question you were asking. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Sure. So now, um, at this point of the, uh, of the, of the research in, in ALS, no? at, at this moment, uh, we are wondering more and more about presymptomatic patients. And this is a very important point that were not maybe 10 years before. What kind of developing technologies or knowledge will be needed to be able to recognize well enough, presymptomatic patients. What do you think? I didn't. You're asking me. <laughs> or whatever. You, yeah. for, you of course. Yeah. And I think the it's rest. a question for Michael. I'm, 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 I'm happy to start. So I think yeah. firstly, this begins with genetic testing of affected individuals and doing that in a widespread manner, and then offering that genetic testing for the identified pathogenic variants to first-degree family members 
obviously with appropriate genetic um, counseling and support um, infrastructure. And so I think extending our paradigm of testing from just the affected or symptomatic population into the unaffected family members um, is going to be one very important step. The other thing that we've observed, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, but didn't name it by name, but maybe this question brings it up, is one of the things that we've observed um, from our prefal study by following people with genetic mutations at risk for disease is that people don't move suddenly from not having disease to having ALS. They go through what we call a prodromal period of what we've called mild motor impairment or MMI. This is very analogous to mild cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease. And we think that this is a prodromal clinical phenotype that is recognizable and potentially identifiable in the clinic. Now we're busy testing this hypothesis now, but if that's right, Imagine we could have community physicians, neurologists, recognizing MMI as a syndrome and referring them for evaluation. That might give us a chance, especially if we then have biomarkers of TDP43 pathology, to say, you have these subtle motor abnormalities and you have a TDP43 biomarker, you are presymptomatic for ALS and we should think about early intervention. And so my hope is that that's one of the places that we will go um, in the future. And for those who think that that is you know, wishful thinking, I would just remind you of what enormous progress has been made in another field of Parkinson's disease with identifying non-genetic prodromal clinical markers. And I'm thinking about REM sleep behavior disorder, I'm thinking about olfactory loss, I'm thinking about constipation, I'm thinking about orthostatic hypotension, I'm thinking about all of these clinical markers, and when you put those into a Bayesian framework and you add the one to the other, you end up with a very high probability that somebody is pre-symptomatic for Parkinson's disease. And my hope is that that's the direction that we will go in the non-genetic or the non-genetically definable population in the future to be able to think about pre-symptomatic studies more broadly. And Michael, um, regarding pre-symptomatic patients, um, and from a clinical point of view, not research, clinical point of view, what do you think we should offer to relatives of, uh, of uh, genetic patients? Should we offer them genetic counseling? And if they are positive, should, should we offer them the option to be follow-up in the clinic? And if they are follow-up in the clinic, should we offer them some kind of tests or just neurological examination or cognitive examination? What do you think, in which point are we now? I know it's different for SOD1 patients and other, of course, but so an overview. I, I love the question, and just to say, we actually organized an international workshop around just this question in um, Philadelphia um, last week or the week before. Um, Jan Leonard was there, as was um, Henk Jan representing Utrecht, and um, we had a number of Europeans, um, and we were trying to get at just these questions. I do think that the minimum is that we should be offering, in the context of counseling, genetic testing, so that family members can make an informed decision about whether they want to know their genetic risk status or not. Once people test positive, if they do carry a genetic variant that puts them at risk, I think we need to discuss with them what are the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of two different approaches. One is to say, go home, live your life, come back and see us when you have symptoms, in which case we probably will end up with a delayed diagnosis. Or do we need to put people onto some sort of clinical surveillance um, and what does that look like? And I think we're working to try to develop that framework. I hope that will come out of this recent workshop. But I think that's going to entail a neurological exam, probably an EMG. For C9 carriers, probably cognitive testing, maybe talking to an informant about um, behaviors. Maybe it's going to entail some neurofilament monitoring as well. But the frequency with which this can get done and how we build the resources and the infrastructure to support it, um, I think is very unclear. But one of the things that I think we can do right now from a clinical management perspective is we can offer support, counseling, an environment where we as a community of ALS clinicians understand these issues and understand that genetic risk carriers um, 
have a need for clinical care as well, even if not to the same extent and complexity as our patients. And we need to hear from our community and figure out how to work with them to provide the support that they need. But I don't have a clear recommendation. We're trying to put our thoughts together. And just one last thing about that is we don't yet have any evidence that starting Rilluzol or Adarabone um, at this early stage is actually beneficial or even that there's a biological rationale. Um, my own view is that we're not yet ready to say we should be giving every SAD1 carrier without disease tofersen. It is associated with potentially serious adverse events, you know, myelitis, papilledema, um, you know, various um, important events. And I think we need to develop the evidential basis to um, guide the treatment, especially for something that, has, as, that is as invasive as uh, monthly lumbar punctures. So, so can I add maybe something? So, so, so. I, I totally agree with this, uh, this, this story about counseling. Uh, but maybe one word of caution, uh, what I notice with many colleagues is some, some sort of blind testing on every patient, you know, and, and then uh, suddenly you have this sporadic patient with a known family but no ALS or FTD, and then you have this mutation or maybe a fuss, and then suddenly this family is sick, you know, then there's this <laughs> anxiety, and then you have to explain this. So, so really, really beforehand, uh, know when to start and, and, and know when not to test. I mean, if you have a, a reliable family history and no indications of a real family disease, then, then maybe be a bit more, uh, well, prudent, especially for C9 when there's no treatment, of course. For SOD1, it's different. But I agree, and I think the, the testing always starts with an affected individual and understanding the right. genetic core of them before we move on to testing yeah, yeah, family yeah. members. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we need no more tools, no? Um, and around the epigenetic world, <laughs> epigenetic knowledge is developing rapidly in the world of biomedicine. It seems that epigenetic changes may be crucial in the appearance of every phenotype, which could give insights into how the same genetic mutation gives rise uh, to different diseases such as ALS or FTD. Due to mutations in several genes, the same like C9 or RF or um, TBK1 and so on. No? To what extent could we consider that these epigenetic changes produced in a specific tissue, not only in the CS CNS, but specifically in a type of neurons inside the CNS, are resp uh, responsible for the appearance of these different types of diseases? This is a very difficult question, <laughs> I would say. <clears throat> and this is also very difficult to experimentally address, yeah? because yeah, you would need tissue from preclinical carriers, for example, what is not available to compare changes, or you would need really monozygotic twins where one got ALS and one got FTD to address this issue. So this is... I think it's almost impossible to address with in real life laboratory work. Um, the other way I think we see in large families, with, for example with C9, that some of the family members got ALS, some got FTD, and some got a mixture of both. And in, uh, in the same family, the people are yeah, genetically more similar. So maybe it is not so much uh, defined by genetics, but it's, it's also possible that it's simply by chance what comes first. So we don't know, I think, if ALS patients would live long enough. Maybe all of them would develop FTD. But we don't know, and this is really very difficult to address, and I only can hypothesize some things here. Yeah, as much as we know, but actually, currently, but maybe what is your opinion about the, in the future, if we, if we could test everything, do you think that this is the real point or the differences between the uh, operation of the different symptoms? I think very big progress would be made if we would completely understand the interplay of genetics and epigenetics. If we exactly know what is of epigenetics is determined by genetics, and then we might develop a model where we can look for differences, what 
causes this difference. But at the moment, I think this is simply impossible. Anyone else? Yes, I agree with you. This is a very, very difficult uh, equation because I think we need to add more factors in this equation and then to consider uh, genetic phenomena uh, such as pleiotropy or other factors that make sense now. We are combining two different sources of genetic uh, variation and we need more information. But uh, I think uh, we are in an earlier stage to, to develop a more robust equation to, to give uh, answer to, mean, to many, uh, to, to different phenotypes. Yeah. It's especially difficult because genetics is influencing the epigenetics, then lifestyle and whatever is influencing the epigenetics, and the disease, disease itself is influencing the epigenetics. So to decipher all these different factors will really be a very, very difficult task for the next decades, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Not, yeah, maybe a glimmer of hope. I mean, it's difficult, complex, of course. But suppose you would follow a big pedigree, the C9, and you had two or four individuals, either with ALS or FTD, who, who had died. You can do a lot. You can do, I mean, especially with newer technologies, you can get epigenetic and genetic information at the same time. Nanopore sequencing, PacBio is working on it. Uh, you have autopsy material, you can do a single nucleus. Uh, ataxic, whatever, or other other um, methods, and then, you know you don't need this huge N of samples, but you have this. We, but but we need clinicians that gather these families and carefully phenotype them, follow them up, convince them to donate their tissues, and, and yeah, that that we should do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the I just wanted to add to that 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 that, that phenotyping piece is so key because I think yes. this sometimes gets forgotten, right? Right, right. We sort of have the diagnostic labels of ALS or FTD, but we haven't carefully looked for cognitive impairment in ALS or motor impairment in FTD. So I want to bring us back to that clinical phenotyping to really empower those studies. Right. Yeah, maybe some mild motor impairment in FTD patients and other way around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And if we could uh, give a weight to genetics and epigenetics, I mean, for the people, the DNA, uh, if we can give the one weight to genetics, the DNA sequence itself, the sequence of its nucleotides, the letters that make up the genetic text, and a different way to epigenetics, which could, would be the underlining, the font size, whether the, we hide light or it, or put it in italics or in a light in perceptible color, okay? Which of the two, genetics or epigenetics, do you think uh, would be the most responsible for the appearance of the symptoms and which would be the most responsible for the symptoms developing? So I think genetics is on top of all because when you start with genetics, you always start at the very beginning of pathogenic cascades. So I would give the genetics a very high weight. However, as we saw in your talk, it's getting more and more complex and it's getting more and more genes involved and so on. And I think it will be a huge effort to uh, um, develop treatments for every gene that is involved. And I think here epigenetics come into play, but because what we saw here is that maybe ALS is indeed more homogeneous at the level of epigenetics. Maybe there's something we can target. And this may be beneficial for a larger group of patients. So I think we need, of course, both approaches. Both are complementary. So. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning is genetics, because without genetics, we don't know where we should start working. Mm -hmm. So that's the starting mm -hmm. point. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, so there's not one number, of course. It's, it's variable. It's the easy answer. Okay, so with C9, people tend to think that they understand maybe why it's sometimes, you know, not, not having a clinical expression. Either people stay healthy or get ALS or FTD. People say, okay, it's the repeat length, mm, not so much indication. Maybe it's methylation. Could be. Almost all repeats are methylated. Uh, it's just a natural reaction probably of, of our body to, to these extreme mutations. But there's this promoter region where a subgroup of patients has like hypermethylation and others uh, don't have. That might be a switch or, or, or we don't know yet. 
Um, so yeah, sometimes people can stay healthy with the sealine orthopedase, so epigenetics might be more important, but we don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's just a, yeah. So it could be more ha like a heavier weight than the, than, than the mutation. I, I'm more. <laughs> thank you. I'm more prone to to think that uh, the combination of both uh, will give uh, a correct answer. Uh, to, uh, to each cases or to each uh, phenotypes. Sometimes genetics will be the most the stronger uh, component and sometimes the epigenetic. But uh, yeah. I think that the combination of both uh, is more complex to understand, but uh, maybe we can uh, give a, a more accurate answer to different situations and to better characterize each patient or each uh, phenotypes. Okay. I would like to ask you about the reproducibility of the, of the epigenetics overall. But uh, if, for example, if we focus in microRNA and we look for results, uh, each uh, research group has different results. Do you think it's a problem that has to do with um, the methodology or rather with the change of population so that different populations have dif different epigenetic changes? I mean, it's a problem of both. So we made the yeah, experience that measuring small RNAs by RNA sequencing is highly variable. It depends on which kits you use for library preparation, for the sequencing itself. You even get different results when you uh, use different softwares to analyze the same data. So I'm not really a big fan of small RNA sequencing. We use the rather old-fashioned microarrays and with those, we get very reproducible results. So it's always the same what we see, no matter what the sample type is. But also in different populations, so in... That's the second point. Um, we are currently um, collaborating with microRNAs with Egypt, that has a East African ancestry somehow, and we see parallels. So, for example, microRNA-206 is known to come from muscle. We also see that in Egyptian patients. And we also see some other changes. For example, this microRNA-338, 5P3P has been suggested as a biomarker. And we see it also in Egyptian patients. But there are a lot of microRNAs we don't see. So there's a lot of variation, but also similarities. So I think we simply have to uh, compare different ethnic groups, and then take the overlap, and then we have the most important ones. Yeah, just one question. In the line of uh, microRNAs, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you said that you should apply different omics in the same samples to characterize the finger molecular fingerprinting. Uh, it's just a curious idea. Uh, you found one microRNA, I don't remember the name, it was uh, the one that regulates to a for A, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, recently, well, in collaboration with uh, uh, with Kako, uh, we found in a proteomic study this protein altered in the uh, CSF of ALS patients in different ways because we have uh, genetic forms and also sporadic forms, and also we included controls. Uh, did you check it as a biomarker? Uh, because no, we didn't. We just did functional studies and okay, did not yes. check it in CFF. Because I, 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 th I think, I'm not sure, uh, you found it downregulated in tissue, it was? Yes, in tissue it was downregulated. Okay. Because we found it and we, we have to check this. Yeah, of course, if it's downregulated and causes death of the cells, you may find it upregulated in CSF. I think you mm -hmm. cannot predict it how fast it is degraded inside and outside of the cell and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's not a, uh, not a contradiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Okay, thanks. Now maybe it's time for the people of the room to, to tell anything, any kind of questions. And we have people in the streaming too, so maybe they have some questions to the round table. Yeah? Thank you. I would like to throw to the panel um, a topic that has not discussed in depth um, as a clinician. I wonder how much pathology 
could um, lead advances in, in, in mostly in the pathogenetics of uh, ALS. We have in Madrid a wonderful uh, brain bank. And um, to what extent we clinicians and relatives can promote either donations or the whole brain or perhaps uh, spinal cord or whatever. And uh, what um, insights could be obtained from this tissue, from this material? Yeah, super useful. It's, it's paramount and, and, and we, we don't have enough brain banks, I think. And so, yeah, there are several things we can learn. Um, the cell type specificity, uh, we can link uh, phenomena to TDP43 um, pathology and degrees of TDP uh, pathology. Uh, there are lots of technological advancements like, um, like spatial transcriptomics, single cell, single nucleus sorting. Um, we can look for somatic mutations. It's still underexplored. We don't know if sporadic disease is being caused by sporadic mutations. It sounds like a bit of crazy hypothesis maybe, but there's this really emerging picture also in Alzheimer's disease that, that um, like active, like neurons that are active, they're post-mitotic, but they're active. And through the process of transcription, they still accrue these somatic mutations, these errors. And if you have, for example, a polygenic uh, susceptibility to DNA damage response, then, then, then you accumulate these mutations and, and, and at some point they, they land in, in, in this motor neuron relevant gene or genes. Uh, okay, so it, this is an unproven hypothesis, and, but it might explain many things. Why is this disease late onset? Why, why is it maybe prion-like spreading? Uh, what, why is it sporadic? Um, and the only way we can answer it is because of brain banks and, and spinal cord and, and um, so, yes, that's super, super important. Of well-phenotyped patients, preferably, and also uh, other layers of data. It would be fantastic. Yeah, I agree that this is highly valuable material because when we're working with molecular mechanisms and whatever, of course we need this material to verify that what we found is really happening in patients. So this is highly valuable. Of course, it is a little bit um, a limit. It also has a limitation, and that is that you only see end stage. And in end stage, for example, if you do a proteomic approach, you will see very, very lots of changes, and you can no more uh, guess what was the cause. But nevertheless, it's highly valuable. And yeah, so, so that often, I agree, but so often people say it's end state, so the, the, you know, the cells of interest are gone, you know, like the ice of, of, of the plane that crashes, the ice is evaporated and it caused the plane to crash and you won't find the cause. But, but that's not entirely true because that's the interesting thing that, you know, patients have several stages of disease in their CNS. And so you can, you can stage patients according to TDP43, so you can see early disease and late disease within one patient. So that's still, still yeah. valuable. Yeah, yeah. I guess I just wanted to add that tissue quality is key in terms of what it can be used for. And so I think our feeling is that you know, tissue is always valuable, brain, spinal cord, but whoever's using it needs to know the quality of the tissue, what the post-mortem interval was, um, and there are ways to ascertain that, but um, just a key consideration. Yeah, and if it's and fresh, I, frozen. I would, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I would echo the importance of that in vivo good clinical phenotypic data with biological samples for biomarker work that can be correlated um, with post-mortem neuropathology. So sort of connecting the two, I think, is incredibly valuable. <laughs> well, I'm Monica. Hi, uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Just if we uh, try to apply the genetic and biomarkers in clinical trials. So uh, I like to ask, what do you think in the last time, no, we have some drugs that the FDA have approved with the results of phase two trial, no, and with uh, the value, well, the improvement of or the result in, with, in neurofilaments, not in the improvement in the clinic, and only 
with the results of neurofilaments. And what do you think the, the role of the biomarkers in clinical trials in the phase two of a clinical trial or what you're experiencing in USA with these kind of trials? A very important question. Thank you for asking that. So I should just caveat up front. I'm not the FDA. I don't know what they think on the inside. But I, I would venture to say that I don't think the FDA's thinking was that they were giving accelerated approval based solely on neurofilament data. I think it's a much more complicated, nuanced picture. Um, I think part of it, let's just start with the neurofilament piece, is the richness of what we know about um, neurofilament um, uh, in terms of understanding it in the untreated state and what it likely means in terms of a clinical benefit over time if you lower neurofilament. So um, that thinking was predicated upon a huge um, body of literature, number one. Number two, I think in addition in the Tofersen data, it's not just a lowering of neurofilament, but it's also a reduction in CSF SOD1 protein levels by about 30%, which is what was expected based on mechanism of action of the drug. Number three, I think there are concerns, and it's easy in retrospect to say this, harder prospectively, that a six-month trial may have been insufficient. You know, it took 12 weeks for neurofilament levels and SOD to come down. It probably will take longer for the clinical benefit, the clinical impact of that to become apparent. And I think once you look at the pre-specified integrated analysis of the double-blind data and the open-label extension, I think it becomes clearer that there is a clinical signal. It's just delayed. Um, and I think we need to learn more about this to better understand that predictive value um, of neurofilament. But I think it's all of those things. So I think one of the values here is imagine we didn't have the neurofilament data. My guess is the FDA would have said there's not enough evidence here to give accelerated approval. So I think think of neurofilament as not the key driver, but as the additional evidence that pushed this over the edge in terms of accelerated approval. And I would venture that every clinical trial going forward in phase two should be using neurofilament, both as a prognostic marker and as a response marker. And you may be aware there's an effort now to stand up a platform trial in the UK that's going to look at repurposed drugs and use a response in neurofilament as a guide to whether this drug seems to be doing anything. Um, and I think using it in that way sort of as an early marker to tell you what is worthy of further study in a longer, bigger, more expensive study, I think is an incredibly um, important and useful um, opportunity. Okay, thank you. And related with the genes, do you think the genetic profile of a patient could be the cause of a failed of a trial? Or, or I, yeah. I'm sorry for my English. The different. Uh, yes. If uh, now with um, we have lithium, no, yeah. and we are re oh, right. re in, yes, re no, introducing again the trial yeah. in a, some kind of patients yeah, no, yeah, yeah, with yeah. one mutation. And I think could be a problem, the genetic profile of the patient yeah. in the clinical trial or not? Yeah. Or we have, or we to, have to check or... Yeah, the understand. inclusion is, is very slow, too slow. It's, it's, it's cumbersome. Uh, so, yeah, um, what would help is, of course, but that's just dreaming that, that you would have a profile in, in everyone, like prospectively. So a patient comes in the clinic, you, you uh, make a diagnosis of ALS, you send serum for NFL, and you send DNA for whatever genotyping you do, some sort of panel or whole genome or whatever. But okay, there you go. And uh, yeah, that, that would, that would, that, that's the dream, of course, that you have these, these data layers and then later maybe the autopsy or whatever. But yeah, but that's, that's a limitation. Uh, so the lithium trial is, um, that's a problem. Um, yeah. Um, and how could it be improved? Just yeah. doing but a whole, include, whole genome no, sequencing we, in every we, patient? Or? Yes, yeah. when we include a patient in a study, we never check. Well, we yeah. check C9, so yeah. one, well, yeah. but if not, we don't check nothing. More. No, exactly. And we, yeah, so, we yeah. have experience with a lot of clinical trials, no? And all the trials fail. Yeah. yeah? Yeah, so we have, when we, have, Rayana, yes. we have thought about it a lot. So, okay, so, so for example, in Europe, we, what we could do, we could think of a situation within NCALS, for example, TriCALS, we have one you know, lab doing these, these things, you send in DNA samples, we do the SNP, PCR, whatever, and boom, result. 
uh, but the amount of paperwork that's involved to get this going, you know, with, with, with this, I mean, given the GDPR, and uh, it's, it's a nightmare, it's really a nightmare. Um, so, yeah, it's a huge problem. <laughs> I don't have any solution other than, than let's, let's hope these, these technologies get cheaper and cheaper. Um, and then, then it's affordable. I mean, at some point, the whole genome will be 50 euros, probably. And then, okay, why not? It's, it's probably cheaper than neurofilament. <laughs> so, yeah, then, then, then it's easy. <laughs> And maybe to come back to the neurofilament question, so I, I would take it even more extreme. This neurofilament assay could also be an in vitro thing. So we've, we've talked about a predictive in vitro assay, you know, if the things will work. Well, I mean, just detecting, you know, in, in the media of a culture or whatever, neurofilament could be, I don't know, maybe it is sensitive or reliable or consistent or yeah, just throwing it out there. And uh, Michael, you um, you have talked about uh, neurofilaments in the Tofersen trial, um, but I would like to to talk also about neurofilaments in the Centaur trial in AMX0035. How can it be that a drug that theori theoretically uh, reduces disease progression and prolongs survival in ALS does not affect neurofilaments? How come that? So, great, great question, and your, your choice of words is very careful. A drug <laughs> ready for um, I, th I think we need to see the phase three data to know whether it actually helps. Um, I guess I'm sort of not entirely convinced based off of the phase two data. I will say that I've not seen their neurofilament light data. They published neurofilament heavy data that um, did not show any change. Um, and I think that's actually fairly profound. Let's turn that question around and say, what we know about neurofilament is that it reflects the speed with which axons are degenerating. And we've given somebody a drug which is supposedly neuroprotective, and it does not seem to have changed the rate with which axons are dying. Is that likely to have a major clinical impact? My guess is not. Um, now, I will have to revisit that position. Obviously, there's good data that shows otherwise. Um, now, that would be different if you had a drug that was working through a different mechanism of action. Think about, you know, a drug working at the level of skeletal muscle and improving muscle contractility. I can totally see how that might lead to a functional benefit um, without changing neurofilament. Um, imagine you have a drug that is preserving not axons that are yet dying, but are dysfunctional at a cellular level. Um, you know, maybe that wouldn't impact neurofilament. So I don't think it's a perfect yardstick, but I think we have to think about um, how the drug works, what we expect it to do to neurodegeneration, and to then fit that into the jigsaw puzzle of what we understand about the biology of the disease and what neurofilament represents. So I'd love to have this discussion again with you once we see the results of the phase three study. <laughs> More questions and comments here? Wait, wait. And my question is my brother is right now with a TOFS trial. TOFS, two researchers have pointed it out. And my question is, why at the beginning of giving the treatment that is, it causes a reduction or a lowering in what is the symptomatology, they be, get worse? And when can one see an improvement, really, of the Tofferson study on the body of the patient? Because my brother has been now two, three months with the treatment, and still we can't see anything, any improvement. And I also would like to know as well if there are any uh, try, any trial or any study that can be marketed in order to be able to be dispensed to the patients with ALS. A new trial, better, better than the Tofferson one, uh, if there is some study right now 
that can be given to the ALS patients apart from the Tofferson study that I know, I know it is a new one, but my brother has been three months on it and he has just got worse. We don't know why, but and I would like when this treatment starts giving good, a good result. Yes. Yes, yes, we have we have understood, yes. We have to translate it for you now. Just if this This is speaking about her brother. She is inside the Tofferson study now, maybe in the OLE, no, in the online and yeah. the ac uh, compassionate use. In the open level. Standard access. In the open level. Mm -hmm. um, she says that, well, maybe you. Uh, I can answer. Sí. What the clinical Tofferson trial is telling us, what it, it is telling us, is that the stabilization starts after the six months of treatment. You notice it after six months, but not probably not in all patients, though we haven't got the data of the trial because we only have the pool data of the overall of the patients. The reduction in the neuronal death starts being seen after the six months of treatment. So if they are measuring your brother, uh, the neurofilaments in the CSF fluid or in serum, we can already detect if the drug is working, although he doesn't notice it himself because we see it before in the test and the, what the patient notices is it. But not having seen any response within the three months is within the expectable thing. And the test that he should submit to, to see if these are neurofilaments, if these are neurofilaments that maybe have been modified, can we see the pro? What is the test that, what should be the test that he has? This is analyzing the CSF fluid when they do the lumbar puncture. It is probable that, yes, the 10 ml. They, in that test, we could already have, could they have an assessment because they haven't told us anything yet. It depends on the case. I don't know how long your brother has been from, has had his symptoms evolving. If he has had a long time, practically one year since he started the symptomatology. The normal thing in those patients is that the neurofilaments are high, elevated, and they will be reduced with the treatment, yes. But the response can vary from one patient to the other, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, well, not wondering, I was amazed that you said before that the, you cannot predict the effect of a mutant in a TDP43 protein. This is correct? You cannot predict? This is what you said before, I guess, no? Because yes. you said that you, you cannot foresee the effect that a mutation may have in this protein regarding, yeah, well, I guess, the stability, because this is what you may look for, right? So uh, if you talk about genetics, genetic results, you can have results that are clear because, you know, are uh, well-described mutations and you know the path pathogenicity very clearly, but most often I would say you have results that you, you are not sure how to interpret it. So very often you have a variant, variants of unknown significance and you, know, you don't really know how to interpret that in clinical practice because it's, it's very difficult to segregate mutations in, in ALS because if there are relatives who have the disease, they, they died, but many times there are no relatives at all. So you cannot check if other diseased person in the family carry the same mutation or not. But uh, can, can you correlate the mutation with a, an amino acid change or something like that in the protein? Yeah, well, I mean, for some mutations, it's very clear that it's damaging, but for other mutations, and missense mutations are very common in, uh, oh. in, in ALS, and missense mutations, uh, you can have different results with different predictors, and very often you must conclude this is a uh, 
variant of unknown significance. You don't know if, he, if this caused the disease. I don't know if yeah. you want to So Yeah, so this is a million dollar question. So the, there have been <coughs> a couple of papers this year. Uh, th th this is where AI comes in again to predict the effect on protein structure and conformation. For example, using AlphaFold, which is this 3D yes. modeling of protein. Yeah. Yeah. But also other, other models are, are and you have this, uh, I think it's called the ESM score. Um, so so you, you, can, you can look up your favorite gene or protein, see if you have an amino acid change in your patient, and you can see if, if it's predicted to be, have a detrimental effect on the protein function. But it's still unclear if it's useful for ALS. But, but it's definitely something we are looking into. We, we're, go, we're going to apply it to, to our, to our gen genetic results to see if, it's, if there's value there. And usually these scores have something to do with selection. So they're only relevant for these super rare traits where, where people don't procreate, you know, like, like congenital diseases. Then you get uh, constraint scores and CAT scores and polyphen scores. And they're all useless for ALS because, because people with ALS procreate. Uh, but, but this could be something that's very valuable to just, just predict what the protein will, how it will change because of a missense mutation. But it's early days. That's a very good question. And even if you, if you, um uh, conclude that the uh, mutation or the variant is pathogenic. Uh, in a sporadic patient, it's very difficult to know uh, how does it mean for the relatives. Yes. Because uh, in well, family cases are less complex, but in a sporadic patients, you don't know. I mean, this variant may be pathogenic, but have a penetrance of 10% or even less. Yeah, exactly. We see that a lot in in SOD1 mutation. We have. Uh, this but the problem family. there, I, what I think, the problem there is that these kind of proteins, they co-precipitate with other proteins. Yeah. So you never know what is going on with your neighborhood. Yeah. So maybe it's somehow related to that, right? That perhaps this TDP43 mutant may aggregate or not if another protein has another muta muta mutation, sorry. Or other biological processes. I exactly. Mean, yeah, that's the fact. But what we see, and, and you show that very clear in your presentation, is that genetics are very important, but they are, they are something more. Yeah. For other patients, yes. and this more, we don't know that. No. no. Yeah, I agree with that what Jan said, that these prediction models, we have them, but at the moment, they are simply, they are not good. Yeah? They have to be improved. Uh, I can tell you from the lab, we had proteins, that were predicted to be absolutely damaging, and we found not a single change um, compared to the wild type protein. And we had proteins that were um, um, predicted to be that the mutations are benign and shouldn't affect anything. And these was the these were the proteins that were most affected at all. Mm -hmm. So there's surely room for a lot of improvement in that. Right. And in ALS, um, yeah, it's difficult because many variants you see in known ALS genes, you see for the first time. So you don't know, you have nothing to compare, is this pathogenic or not. You just have to rely on these predictions and in the end you have to tell it the patients. But telling them that you don't know is also not very uh, good. Thank you. Alguna pregunta más? Uh, any more questions here? Or maybe, I, I'm not sure if the people in streaming could be, could do a bit of any kind of questions. I don't know how. 100 questions in the chat, maybe. <laughs> I didn't check. <laughs> no. Michael can see. We can check. OK. Well, maybe uh, to finish the, this, the round table, a message for the, for the people that is uh, listening to us, uh, a message from all of you related to genetics, epigenetics, and biomarkers who want to... Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I think it... Okay, so as this discussion shows there are many unanswered questions and, and we should not overhype maybe knowledge we, we don't have. Um, but uh, I think I think there is reason for hope. Uh, I think the Tofurson really, really, really story really shows this. 
Uh, of course, it's not a promise or a guarantee that every genetic variable you'll find with some penetrants will have a similar effect maybe if, if there is some specific therapy. Uh, but it, it will also help us to build these preclinical models and to see you know, what is ALS in a dish. So, so we can also test general compounds. We can throw in Amelix, we can throw in ibuprofen, we can throw in other drugs and see if it does anything on ALS in a dish, uh, which also helps speed up maybe clinical trial uh, in general. Uh, so I think I think still there's it's an exciting time because of all these technological developments and so there's reason for hope. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, I guess I just want to add that I think there is reason for hope, and I would also point to the recent Tofersen experience. I think for the first time we have a drug that we believe biologically is doing something, and I think if given early enough, um, we'll do even more clinically. And it's showing us a path forward into thinking about early intervention and disease prevention. And just imagine, do the thought experiment, if we're actually able to prevent a form of ALS, even a rare form, what that would mean in terms of how we change our paradigms of thinking um, about how to approach this for other patients. And what I would add to that is I think the other incredibly important learning from um, the FDA's approval of Tofersen is that we now have sort of a new drug development tool in the form of neurofilament as a response biomarker that we can use in other clinical trials to, um, to help us. And that's the kind of tool that will help not just the SOD1 population, but my hope is every patient um, and every family facing this disease. Uh, I agree that there's hope because, especially in the last years, the discoveries are getting faster and faster, technology is getting better and better, and I think we slowly begin to understand this disease. And just a few years ago, so not long ago, there were no biomarkers, we knew much less about genetics, there was no two first and treatment options for SOT1 patient and so on. So I think we're living now at the time of discoveries, and we will see much more in the future, and discoveries will come faster and faster. Mm -hmm. I also agree with all of you, and I think that uh, ALS also it's a very complex disease. We are in the right uh, in the right way, in, the, in a good way, to identify the the right pa panel of um, factors, biomarkers, and every everything. We are studying with different tools. To, uh, to get an earlier prognosis and diagnosis, and uh, especially to, to identify this disease in patients that uh, it, it is not manifest. So I think it's, uh, it's also a message of hope. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm really optimistic about the future. Uh, in the 11 years I've, I've been devoted to motor neuron diseases, I have seen a lot of changes and things that no, many years ago, we, we would think were impossible to, to see. Um, so I'm, I'm really optimistic. I know that for patients, maybe uh, too slow, but uh, I think it's, 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 it's really uh, advancing fast for, for the, you know, for the regular um, advances in medicine, which always take some time. But I'm really optimistic about the future. Yeah, from a research point of view, uh, I think that we are in the right way, but I think that I miss uh, some biggest collaborations at different levels, not only at genetic and epigenetic. I strongly miss uh, something about biomarkers in biofluids, whatever, uh, plasma, serum, whatever. But I think that we have to work together to try to find the complete characterization of patients to understand, to much better understand the disease itself in a personalized manner for each patient. But we are in the right way. So we I, I think we are in a new era, no? the new pharmaco pharmacological era is the um, time, uh, is the biological or molecular developing of a pharmacological um, molecules. And this is the difference from the previous one, and it's because of genetics, epigenetics, and biomarkers. No? And well, the future is uh, near, maybe. Thank you very much for all of, for all of you. Thank you, Michael, for being 
connected with us all, the, all this time. And well, maybe we will follow with this field in the near future. Thank you so much. And thank you again to Fundación Luzón and Fundación Ramón Areces to do this, uh, to, to do all of this, no? Okay. Thank you.